That one word. That's why they're after you, Mr. Attorney General. Fifteen months ago, April 10th, 2019, in a Senate hearing, you said this sentence, quote, I think spying on a political campaign is a big deal. Spying on a political campaign is a big deal. It sure is. And since that day, since that day, when you had the courage to state the truth, they attack you. They've been attacking you every since, every day, every week, for simply stating the truth that the Obama-Biden administration <laughs> spied on the Trump campaign. One year ago, New York Times headline said this. One year ago, quote, FBI sent investigator posing as assistant to meet with Trump aide in 2016. The FBI sent a young lady who used the name Azra Turk to meet Papadopoulos in September of 2016. They sent someone pretending to be someone else to meet a person associated with the Trump campaign. You know what they call that? You know what they call that? Spying. One month later, October 2016, they used the dossier to spy on Carter Page. The salacious, unverified dossier, Jim Comey's words, not mine. They took it to the FISA court, didn't tell the courts that the Clintons paid for it, didn't tell the court that the guy who wrote the document, Christopher Steele, had already communicated to the Justice Department that he was, quote, desperate to stop Trump from getting elected. And guess what? There were 15 more lies that they told the court. 17 in total. They're outlined by the inspector general, each and every one of them in his 400-page report. But guess what? Chairman Nadler refuses to allow Mr. Horowitz to come here and testify and answer our questions about the 17 lies the Obama-Biden administration told to the secret court. The Obama-Biden DOJ opened the investigation in July. They used a secret agent lady to spy on Papadopoulos in August. They lied to the FISA court in September, and they did all this without any basis for launching the investigation to begin with. How do we know that? How do we know there was no basis? They told us. Now, they didn't want to tell us, but thanks to Rick Grinnell, who released the transcripts of their testimony, we now know there was no basis for them to start the investigation in the first place. Sally Yates, Rhodes, Samantha Power, Susan Rice. Here's what Susan Rice says. I don't recall intelligence I would consider evidence of a conspiracy. How about James Clapper? I never saw any direct evidence that the Trump campaign or someone in it was conspiring with the Russians to meddle with the election. Say that again. I never saw evidence that the Trump campaign was conspiring, and yet they investigate him. There was never a proper predicate. So why'd they do it? There was no reason to do it. Why'd they do it? They told us that too. Peter Strzok, August 2016, asked, is Trump going to win? What's his response? Remember, this is Peter Strzok. This is the guy who ran the investigation. No. No, he's not. We'll stop it. August Peter Strzok says, we'll stop Trump. September, they spy on Papadopoulos. October, they use the fake dossier to lie to the court. But guess what happens in November? Guess what happens in November? November 8th, 2016, the American people get in their way. 63 million of them, to be exact. Not er now everything changes. Now the real focus is, wow, wait a minute. We didn't stop him. He won. Now what do they have to do? They have to do the cover-up. And who do they have to go after? Who's target number one in their cover-up? The former head of the Defense Intelligence Agency, the guy who's about to become national security advisor to the president of the United States, Michael Flynn. They can't have him hanging around because he'll figure it out. So they decide to go after Michael Flynn. Three-star general served our country for over three decades. And we know they went after him because they told us that too. Bill Priestep, head of counterintelligence at the FBI, the day they interview Flynn, January 24, 2017, his notes say what? What's our goal? To get Flynn to lie so we can prosecute him or to get him fired? Think about what the Obama-Biden DOJ, what their administration did in the last month. The last month they were in power. January 4th, the agents investigating Flynn want to drop the case. Comey tells them no. January 5th, they have the now famous meeting in the Oval Office. Obama, Biden, Rice, Comey, all of them are in there. They're plotting their strategy, how they're going to get Flynn. January 6th, Comey goes up to Trump Tower briefs President-elect Trump on the dossier that they already know is false, just so they can leak it to the press and the press will write the story that they briefed the president on the dossier. And then, of course, January 24th, the day they go, set up Michael Flynn, set up Michael Flynn in his interview. Guess what else they did? Guess what else they did between Election Day and Inauguration Day? That two-month time, guess what else they did? 38 people, 49 times unmasked Michael Flynn's name. 
Comey, Clapper, Brennan, Biden, seven people at the Treasury Department unmasked Michael Flynn's name, for goodness sake. And of course, Flynn resigns on February 13th. Flynn resigns on February 13th. Now the cover-up is complete. Flynn's gone. Everything's fine, they think, until May 9th, 2017, when President Trump fires Jim Comey. Now they got a problem again. The guy who was going to keep it all quiet, he's been fired. Now, how do they continue the cover-up? Real simple. Jim Comey leaks his memos with the express purpose of getting a special counsel appointed to investigate something they already know is not true. And that's exactly what happened. We get two years, 19 lawyers, 40 agents, 500 witnesses, 2,800 subpoenas, and a 30 million cost to the taxpayer, and they come back with nothing. Absolutely nothing. And so all they got left is to attack the attorney general who had the courage to state the truth right from the get-go. The first time he testifies after he's confirmed. And you guys attack him every day, every week, and now you've filed articles of impeachment against him. It's ridiculous. He had the courage to do what no one else would do at the Justice Department. Sally Yates wouldn't call it spying. Jeff Sessions wouldn't do it. Rod Rosenstein wouldn't do it. Chris Way, Ray sure as heck isn't going to do it. So, Mr. Tringer, I want to thank you for having the courage to call it what it was, spying. I want to thank you for having the courage to say we're going to get the politics out of the Department of Justice that was there in the previous administration. And maybe most importantly, and we're going to talk about this in our side on questioning, I want to thank you for defending law enforcement, for pointing out what a crazy idea this defund the police I, uh, policy, whatever you want to call it, is, and standing up for the rule of law. And frankly, we have a video we want to show that gets right to this point. Can we play that video, please? clear in how I characterize this. This is a, mostly a protest. Uh, it is not, uh, it is not generally speaking, unruly. Peaceful protest. Peaceful protesters. Peaceful protest. 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 Peaceful protesters. On behalf of myself, my children, and the family of David Dorn, we'd like to thank friends, neighbors, co-workers, and the community for showing all the love and support we've suffered through the tragic loss of my husband, my beloved husband, David Dorn. We'd also like to thank St. Louis Metropolitan Police Department for their hard work and perseverance through this investigation as well as the circuit attorney's office. He dedicated his life to the city of St. Louis, retiring at the rank of captain after 38 years of distinguishable service. Then as a chief of Moline Acres for almost six years. During those years, he's touched so many lives as a friend, mentor, co-worker, and guardian. His life was senselessly taken from me, from us, by an opportunist who had no regards for human life or the law. This didn't have to happen, but it must have been God's plan for David. We need to come together as a community and do better. We need to teach our young people that life is very precious. We as a family are going to be taking some time to focus our attention on healing which is very important as we move forward. We would like David's legacy to be remembered as a loving husband, father, grandfather, brother, uncle, friend, colleague, and most importantly, a child of God. I'm gonna thank you all for coming and God bless you all.
that uh, Mr. Jordan will never uh, complain about the length of my opening statement. Without objection, I am going to insert the committee's uh, audiovisual policy into the record of this hearing uh, and note 
that the minority did not give the committee the 48-hour notice required by that policy. Without objection, all other opening statements will be included in the record. I will now introduce today's witnesses. William Barr has served as the Attorney General of the United States since February 14, 2019, having previously served in the same position from 1991 to 1993 under President George H.W. Bush. He also served as Deputy Attorney General and Assistant Attorney General of the Office of Legal Counsel under the Bush administration, was a member of the domestic policy staff under President Reagan, served in the Central Intelligence Agency, and was a law clerk for Judge Malcolm Wilkie of the U.S. Court of Appeals for the D.C. Circuit. In addition to his significant public service, he also has extensive experience practicing law in the private sector. Attorney General Barr received his A.B. and M.A. from Columbia University and a J.D. from George Washington University School of Law. We welcome the Attorney General and we thank him for participating today. Now, if you would please rise, I will begin by swearing you in. Would you raise your right hand, please? Or left hand. Do you swear or affirm under penalty of perjury that the testimony you're about to give is true and correct to the best of your knowledge, information, and belief, so help you God? Let the record show the witness has answered in the affirmative. Thank you, and please be seated. Please note that your written statement will be entered into the record in its entirety. Accordingly, I ask that you summarize your testimony in five minutes. To help you stay within that time, there is a timing light on your table. When the light switches from green to yellow, you have one minute to conclude your testimony. When the light turns red, it signals your five minutes have expired. Mr. Barr, you may begin. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Good morning, Mr. Chairman, Ranking Member Jordan. I'm pleased to be here this morning. On behalf of the Department of Justice, I want to pay my respects uh, to your colleague, Congressman John Lewis, an indomitable champion of civil rights and the rule of law. I think it is especially important to remember today that he pursued his cause passionately and successfully with unwavering commitment to nonviolence. As I said in my confirmation hearing, the Attorney General has a unique obligation. He holds in trust the fair and impartial administration of justice. He must ensure that there is one standard of justice that applies to everyone equally and that criminal cases are handled even-handedly based on the law and the facts and with rega art re without regard to political or personal considerations. And I can tell you that I've handled criminal matters that have come to me for decision in this way. The President has not attempted to interfere in these decisions. On the contrary, he has told me from the start that he expects me to exercise my independent judgment to make whatever call I think is right, and that is precisely what I've done. Indeed, it's precisely because I feel complete freedom to do what I think is right that induced me to serve once again as Attorney General. As you just said, Mr. Chairman, I served as Attorney General under President George H.W. Bush, and after that I spent many years in the corporate world. I'm almost 70 years old. I was almost 70 years old and slipping happily into retirement I had nothing to prove and I had no desire to return to government. I had no prior relationship with President Trump. Let me turn briefly to the several pressing issues of the day. The horrible killing of George Floyd in Minneapolis understandably jarred the whole country and forced us to reflect on longstanding issues in the nation. Those issues obviously relate to the relationship between law enforcement and the African-American community. Given our history, it's understandable that among black Americans, there's at least some ambivalence and often distrust toward the police. Until just last 50 years ago or so, our laws were institu and our institutions were explicitly racist, explicitly discriminatory. It was not until the 60s that the civil rights movement finally succeeded in tearing down the Jim Crow edifice. Our laws finally came to formally embody the guarantee of equal protection. And since then, the work of securing civil rights has rightly focused on reforming institutions to ensure they better conform to our laws and to our aspirations. That work, it's important to acknowledge, has been increasingly successful. Police forces today are far more diverse than they've ever been. 
and there are uh, both more black police chiefs and more black officers in the ranks. Although the death of George Floyd at the hands of the police was a shocking event, the fact is that these events are fortunately quite rare. According to statistics compiled by the Washington Post, the number of unarmed black men killed by police so far this year is eight. The number of unarmed white men killed by police over the same period of time is 11. And the overall numbers of police shootings have been decreasing. Nevertheless, every instance of excessive force is unacceptable and must be addressed appropriately through legal process, as is happening now in Minneapolis. But apart from the numbers, I think these events strike a deep chord in the black community because they are perceived as manifestations of a deeper, lingering concern that in encounters with police, blacks will not be treated even-handedly. They will not be given the benefit of the doubt. They will be treated with greater suspicion. Senator Tim Scott has recounted the numerous times he's been unjustifiably pulled over on Capitol Hill. And as one prominent black professional in Washington said to me, African Americans often feel treated as suspects first and citizens second. And I think these concerns are legitimate. At the same time, I think it would be an oversimplification to treat the problem as rooted in some deep-seated racism generally infecting our police departments. It seems far more likely that the problem stems from a complex mix of factors which can be addressed with focused attention over time. And we in law enforcement must be conscious of the concerns and ensure that we do not have two systems of justice. Unfortunately, some have chosen to respond to George Floyd's death in a far less pr productive way by demonizing the police, promoting slogans like all cops are bastard, and making grossly irresponsible uh, proposals to defund the police. The demonization of the police is not only unfair and inconsistent with principles of all people should be treated as individuals, but gravely injurious to uh, the inner city communities. When communities turn on and pillory the police, officers naturally become more risk averse and crime rates soar. Unfortunately, we are seeing that now in many of our cities. The threat to black lives posed by crime on the streets is massively greater than any threat posed by police misconduct. The leading cause of death for young black males is homicide. Every year, approximately 7,500 black Americans are victims of homicide. The, mass, the vast majority of them, around 90%, are killed by other blacks, mainly by gunfire. Each of those lives matter. It is for this reason that in selected cities where there has been an upsurge in violent crime, we are stepping up and bolstering the activities of our joint anti-crime task forces. Finally, I want to address a different breakdown in the rule of law that we've witnessed over the past two months. In the wake of George Floyd's death, violent rioters and anarchists have hijacked legitimate protests to wreak senseless havoc and destruction on innocent victims. The current situation in Portland is a telling example. Every night for the past two months, a mob of hundreds of rioters have laid siege to the federal courthouse and other nearby federal property. The rioters have come equipped for fight, armed with powerful slingshots, tasers, sledgehammers, saws, knives, rifles, and explosive devices. Inside the courthouse are a relatively small number of federal law enforcement personnel charged with, defense, with a defensive mission to protect the courthouse. What unfolds nightly around the courthouse cannot reasonably be called protest. It is, by any objective measure, an assault on the government of the United States. As elected officials of the federal government, every member of this committee, regardless of your political views or your feelings about the Trump administration, should condemn violence against federal officers and the destruction of federal property. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, uh, and I appreciate your uh, listing for me the areas of concern uh, in your opening statement, and I'm looking forward to addressing them all. Thank you for your testimony. We will now proceed under the five-minute rule with questions, and I will recognize myself for five minutes. On July 22nd, you joined the President as he announced the expansion of Operation Legend 
an initiative. Let me start that again. On July 22nd, you joined the president as he announced the expansion of Operation Legend, an initiative to combat violent crime in Kansas City with approximately $61 million in DOJ grants. I am confused, however, as to the purpose of launching Operation Legend at this moment in time. In December of last year, you announced that the department would divert over $70 million in grants to seven U.S. cities under an initiative called Operation Relentless Pursuit, correct? That's right. And Operation Relentless Pursuit targeted a familiar list of cities, places like Albuquerque, Baltimore, and Kansas City, correct? Correct. At the same July 22nd press conference, you initially claimed that over 200 arrests had been, had been made under Operation Legend, correct? Correct. At that, but you misspoke. Correct. The U.S. Attorney's Office for the Western District of Missouri later confirmed that only a single arrest had been made under the auspices of Operation Legend, correct? I, I don't know. And the, uh, other, and the 199 other arrests were made under Relentless Pursuit or other programs. Well, that was correct. I think you could be forgiven for being confused. Operation Legend appears to be little more than a repackaging of existing operations in these cities. So why all the drama? Why join the President at the White House to announce a bold new operation that appears to be neither bold nor new? Understandably, Americans are very suspicious of your motives here. There are those who believe you are sending federal law enforcement to, into these cities not to combat violent crime, but to help with the President's re-election efforts. The President has made clear that he, wants con that he wants conflict between protesters and police to be a central claim, a central theme of his campaign. So let me ask you directly, Mr. Barr. Yes or no? Yes or no? Did you rebrand existing projects under the legend in order to assist the president in an election year? I wouldn't call Mr. it. I wouldn't Attorney call it. General, yeah. would you agree with me at least on principle that it is improper for the Department of Justice to divert resources and law enforcement personnel in an effort to assist the president's re-election campaign? No, uh, Mr. Chairman, in the fall, we did inaugurate an anti-crime uh, initiative because we were concerned about increasing violent crime in a number of cities, and we called that relentless pursuit. Unfortunately, COVID intervened, and our agents who were detailed for these assignments could not perform uh, the operation. So the operation was squelched by COVID. So we couldn't complete uh, or make much progress on relentless pursuit. However, in the intervening time, we saw violent crime continuing to rise, and a lot of that was triggered by the events after uh, the uh, death of George Floyd. So we did reboot the program after COVID started breaking and our, we could commit the law enforcement resources to actually accomplish uh, the mission, which is to reduce violent crime. Now, I regret that COVID interrupted our law enforcement activities, but it doesn't obviate the fact that there is serious violent crime in these cities. These police and, and mayors from, have been asking us for help, and we have put in uh, additional federal agents and investigators to help deal with it. Have you, now, yes or no, have you discussed the president's re-election campaign with the president or with any White House official or any surrogate of the president? Well, I'm not going to get into my discussions with the president. Well, have you discussed that topic with him, yes or no? Not in, not in relation to this program. I didn't ask that. I asked if you discussed that. With I'm a member of the cabinet, and there's an election going so, on. Obviously, the topic so comes the up. Yes. Well, the, the topic yes. comes up in cabinet meetings and other things. Okay. It shouldn't be a surprise that, that the topic of the election. Comes. I didn't say I was surprised. I just asked if you'd done that. So as part of those conversations with the president uh, or his people about the re-election campaign, have you ever discussed the current or future deployment of federal law enforcement? In connection with what? In connection with what you just said, in connection with, the, with your discussions with the president or with other people around him, of his re-election campaign, have you discussed the current or future deployment of federal law enforcement? Well, as I say, I'm not going to get into my discussions with the president, but I've made it clear that I would like to pick the cities based on law enforcement need and based on neutral criteria. So, but you, you can't tell me whether you discussed... No, I'm not going to discuss what I discussed with the president. Can you commit today 
that the Department will not use federal law enforcement as a prop in the President's re-election campaign? We are not using I just want to close with this thought. You really can't hide behind legal fictions this time, Mr. Barr. It's all out in the open, where the people can see what you are doing for themselves. The President wants footage for his campaign ads, and you appear to be serving it up to him as ordered. In most of these cities, the protests had begun to wind down before you marched in and confronted the protesters. And the protesters aren't mobs. They are mothers and veterans and mayors. In this moment, real leadership would entail de-escalation, collaboration, and looking for ways to peaceably resolve our differences. Instead, you use pepper spray and truncheons on American citizens. You did it here in Washington. You did it at Lafayette Square. You expanded to Portland. And now you are projecting fear and violence nationwide in pursuit of obvious political objectives. Shame on you, Mr. Barr. Can I just say, Mr. Shame on you. Can I just My say, time Mr. has expired. Uh, uh, for what purpose does Mr. Jordan see recognition? No, no, Mr. Johnson. Mr. Excuse could, me. I just, could I just what have a moment? Does Mr. My time has expired. For what purpose does Mr. Uh, Mr. Johnson seek recognition? Questions for the witness, and I will yield the floor to him to respond. Yeah. Mr. Chairman, you, you've conflated two different things. The, the, the effort, like legend, uh, is to deal with violent crime, crime that's committing on the streets of the city. Again, predatory violence like murder shootings, which are soaring in some cities right now. Uh, that does not involve encountering protesters, as you refer to it. Civil disturbance is a different set of issues. And uh, I, I just reject the idea that the department has flooded anywhere and, and attempted to suppress demonstrators. We make a clear distinction between demonstrators. The facts speak well, I'm, 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 This is my time, I'm Mr. Chairman. Answering. And, and, you know, the fact of the matter is, if you take Portland, Portland, the courthouse is under attack. The federal resources are inside the perimeter around the courthouse, defending it from almost two months of daily attacks where people march to the court, try to gain entrance, and have set fires, thrown things, used explosives, uh, and uh, injured police, including just this past weekend, perhaps permanently blinding three federal officers with lasers. We are on the defense. It's, we're not out looking for, for trouble. And if the state uh, and the city would provide the law enforcement services that other jurisdictions do, we would have no need to have additional uh, marshals in the courthouse. On behalf of hundreds of millions of Americans, thank you for that clarification and thank you for being here. And thank you for your service today and uh, your willingness to do this in very challenging times. Uh, Mr. Attorney General, we're, we're very appreciative. It's not an easy job. It's a vitally important one. I so appreciated what you said in your opening statement today, which is what you said in your confirmation hearing. The Attorney General has a unique obligation. He must, he holds in trust the fair and impartial administration of justice. We appreciate that so much. The Democrats have asserted here this morning, and they continue to say in the media, that under your leadership, the Justice Department has become highly politicized. Why is that a totally unfounded allegation? Because actually what I've been trying to do is restore the rule of law. And the rule of law is, at essence, that we have one rule for everybody. If you apply one rule to A, the same rule applies to B. And I felt we didn't have that uh, previously at the department. We had strayed. And uh, I would just ask people, uh, I'm supposedly uh, punishing the president's enemies and helping his friends. What enemies have I indicted? Who, who, could you point to one indictment that has been under the department that you feel is, is unmerited, did, that you feel violates the rule of law? One indictment. Now, you say I helped the president's friends. The, the cases that are cited, the Stone case and the Flynn case, are both cases where I determined uh, that some intervention was necessary to rectify the rule of law, to make sure people are treated the same. I said all oh, Stone was prosecuted under me, and I said all along I thought that was a righteous prosecution. I thought he should go to jail, and I thought the judge's sentence was correct. But the line prosecutors were trying to advocate for a sentence that was more than twice anyone else in a similar position had ever served. And this is a 67-year-old man 
first-time offender, no violence, and they were trying to put him in jail for seven to nine years. And I wasn't going to advocate that because that is not the rule of law. I agree the president's friends don't deserve special breaks, but they also don't deserve to be treated more harshly than other people. And sometimes that's a difficult decision to make, especially when you know you're going to be castigated for it. But that is what the rule of law is, and that's what fairness to the individual ultimately comes to, being willing, being willing to do what's fair to the individual. Amen, and thank you for that. And by contrast, what the previous DOJ did under the previous administration was politicize law enforcement. The Obama-Biden administration sabotaged the Trump transition. They illegally spied on the Trump campaign. They unmasked members of the Trump campaign. They employed aggressive tactics on their, on their campaign officials. Senior FBI officials we all know on this committee carried over from the Obama administration uh, carried on their abuses into the Trump administration and into the whole impeachment scam and all the rest. Let me ask you just one question um, because my time is running out. President Obama's Attorney General Eric Holder famously referred to himself as President Obama's wingman. He said in an interview, quote, I'm still enjoying what I'm doing. There's still work to be done. I'm still the president's wingman, so I'm there with my boy. That's what he said famously. Is it the duty of the Attorney General to be the president's wingman? No, I've already described what I think the duty of the Attorney General is. And, and in your office, you are then free to act independently of the President. Isn't that true? That is true, particularly on criminal cases. It's required. And that's exactly what he has asked you to do. Isn't that yes. right? Yes. I uh, have no further time. time I yield back. Thank you. Uh, it's well, you have no further questions. Your time has expired. Uh, Ms. Lofgren. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Attorney General, it's obvious uh, what is happening here uh, from the video played uh, during the ranking members' remarks. It's clear that the President's playbook is to divert attention from his catastrophic failure in dealing with the COVID-19 uh, situation. In Canada, our neighbor to the north, in Europe, the virus has re been reduced to such a level that people can safely go out and not worry about being infected. But here in the United States, millions of Americans have been infected. Tens of thousands are dying, and the president needs to divert from that failure. And what is the playbook? The playbook is to create the impression that there is violence that he must send in federal troops and that the, that the American people sh uh, should be afraid of other Americans and trust the president because he's going to send in all troops to American cities. And that's how he hopes to win the election. You know, it's one thing to fight crime with joint task forces. That involves the cooperation of state and local officials. But the governor of Oregon and the mayor of Portland has asked that the federal troops leave because the reaction has actually been uh, in, in reverse proportion. People are showing up because the troops are there. And I'd like to say that so many of them, I would say most of them, are uh, nonviolent. We've all heard about the wall of moms, the wall of moms who, who show up uh, to make sure that people are safe. And here's what they say. They say they've been tear gassed night after night, left vomiting, that they've been shot at with rubber bean bags, pepper spray. So this brutality has created even more demonstrators. I'd just like to ask you this. Uh, it, when the president issued his executive order, they indicated your department should prioritize investigations has your uh, department started any investigations pursuant to the executive order that the president issued? Which executive order, Congresswoman? The executive order that uh, asked for the deployment of uh, troops to uh, protect the monuments and the federal uh, facilities. Yes. The, the, On June 26th. Yeah, I wouldn't say it was troops, but the... the, the, the uh, we have initiated investigations, yes. We've made arrests of people, who, who, people who, have, who have been rioting and taken down uh, uh, statues. But I, I think your, your characterization of Portland is completely false. Uh, we, I, would like to, I would like to, we can get 
into that, but I'd like to ask you a question about surveillance, if I may. Uh, we've heard reports that cell site stimulators known as stingrays or dirt boxes are being used to collect phone call location and even content of phone calls. Drones are being used that may have face recognition or cell phone interception technology and that there is bulk collection of internet browsing history. What specific authority is the department using for these surveillance tools? I really can't speak to the to, to those instances if, if they in fact occurred. I'm glad to go and, and try to determine what you're talking about. Well, actually, I'm asking about authority, not uh, the, the details. Well, the, you know, the, I think the, most of our cyber activities are conducted by the FBI under their law enforcement powers to detect and prevent crime, federal crime. I think the American public should know that this surveillance technique is just about the people in, you know, in front of the courthouse. If a husband and wife call each other and one of the uh, spouses has a cell phone that's within range of one of these uh, technologies, not only the location, but the actual content of that couple's conversation can be scooped up using this technology. So this really isn't just about the demonstrating. This is about the privacy of all Americans, and it's all being violated for the president's political purposes of trying to create a scene, create a reason, divert attention from the COVID failure. I think it's really very unfortunate and a disservice to the American people. Mr. Our chairman, my time has expired. So the point, point, of, point of order. General lady yields back. Uh, Mr. Chairman, purposes. point of order. Real quick. Gentlemen, the state is point of order. Could you ask those members who choose not to come to work to silence their cell phones on the video because it's distracting to what we're doing here today? That is not a point of order. The, uh, the, uh, I, I now recognize uh, Mr. Chabot. Mr. Attorney General, would it be accurate to say that it's this administration's responsibility, and of course you're part of the administration, to see that federal laws are upheld and that the federal property uh, is secure and safe and protected, is, is that correct? <clears throat> That's right, Congressman. There, there are sort of distinct missions. One mission is to enforce federal law. And by the way, the federal government is the sovereign of the United States. We have two sovereigns here uh, in the United States, and we enforce the federal law all over the country. Every square foot of the country, we enforce federal law. The other is protecting federal property and specifically U.S. courthouses, which are the heart of federal property in all 93 jurisdictions in the United States. And we have the obligation to, pro to, to protect federal courts, and the U.S. Marshals specifically have been given that obligation. Federal courts are under attack. Since when is it okay to try to burn down a federal court? If someone went down the street to the Prettyman Court here, that beautiful courthouse we have right at the bottom of the hill, and started breaking windows and firing industrial-grade fireworks in to start a fire, throw kerosene balloons in and, and start fires in the court, is that okay? Is that okay now? No, the U.S. Marshals have a duty to stop that and defend the courthouse, and that's what we are doing in Portland. We are at the courthouse defending the courthouse. We're not out looking for trouble. Thank you, General. And, and as far as weapons and devices that were utilized by the group of people, and, and you mentioned trying to destroy the courthouse. I mean, they were literally trying to burn it down uh, and apparently didn't give a hoot about the people that were occupied in the building as well. So people were in danger. That is absolutely right. So as far as the, the weapons that you mentioned, let me get this straight. Um, my understanding is that the, the people attacking the building had among other things, rifles, explosives, knives, saws, sledgehammers, tasers, slingshots, rocks, bricks, lasers. Have I missed anything, or does that about cover it? Um, you have missed some things, but that's a, that's a good list. Well, well, but, you know, they have these powerful slingshots with ball bearings that they shoot. They've used pellet guns, we believe. We have found uh, those uh, projectiles uh, at you know, have penetrated uh, marshals to the bone. Uh, and they use the, the lasers to blind the, the, to blind the marshals. Um, 
they do start fires. They start fires if they can get in the fire inside or through the windows, and they start fires along the outside of the the pres- of the, uh, the uh, courthouse. When the marshals come out to try to deal with the fire, they're assaulted. General, if, if local elected officials, mayors and city councils and governors did their jobs and kept the peace, uh, would it even be necessary for federal law enforcement personnel to be there in the first place? No, and that's exactly the point. Look around the country. Even where there are these kinds of riots occurring, uh, we don't, we haven't had to put in the kind of re- reinforcements that we have in Portland because the state and local law enforcement does their job and won't allow rioters to come and just physically assault the courthouse. In Portland, that's not the case. General, um, some have derisively referred to these law enforcement personnel as stormtroopers and worse. Does that accurately describe them? Would you like to set the record straight? No, they're obviously not stormtroopers. You know, normally we would have a group of deputy marshals in a court that would be, uh, you know, in business suits and ties or regular uh, civilian dress. Those would be the deputy marshals as the protective force for the court. But after almost a month of rioting in Portland, you know, we sent in, I think it was around the 4th of July time frame, we sent in about 20 special operations uh, marshals. Uh, and those are tactical teams that are able, you know, are, are padded and protected so they could deal with this kind of thing. Up until last week, uh, I was told we had our, our stormtrooper from the Department of Justice amounted to 29 marshals in the courthouse. 29 marshals. As of la- uh, until recently increased, I think there were 95, I was told, uh, 95 DHS, and, uh, Federal Pro- Protective Service, and other DHS officers trying to protect the courthouse and three other buildings. That's what we're trying to do. We're trying to protect federal functions and federal buildings, which are a very small part of the city, but the rioters go uh, at them, and, and we have gradually increased our numbers there to try to protect those uh, those facilities. If, if the state would come in and, and keep peace on the streets in front of the courthouse, we wouldn't need additional people at the courthouse. Thank you, General. My time's expired. Gentlemen's time has expired. Uh, Ms. Jackson Lee. Mr. Chairman, before I begin, I'd like to submit into the record a picture of Lewis and Clark History Department Chair of Shot at Protests in Portland. I ask unanimous consent to place that into the record. John Lewis in 1963 said, we're tired about being beat by police. We're tired of being put in jail. We want our freedom now. Mr. Attorney General, in your remarks, you indicated that we've made great progress since that time. And you indicated that the killing of George Floyd was shocking. I disagree. It was outright cold-blooded murder on the streets of America unfortunately, by police misconduct. You seem to have a difficult time understanding systemic racism and institutional racism that has plagued so many. Mr. Attorney General, do you understand a black mother's or parent's talk to their child, to their son? Do you know what that is? I think I do. Uh, I don't know if you do, but Trayvon Martin, Ahmed Arbery, Tamir Rice, Michael Brown, Sean Bell, and George Floyd. Black mothers and fathers have had to talk to their sons about police violence. I take no backseat to the history of this committee that has stood for good policing, not misconduct. And so I ask you this question, does the Trump Justice Department seek to end systemic racism and racism in law enforcement? I just need a yes or no answer. To the extent there is racism in any of our institutions in this country and the police, then obviously this administration is, will fully enforce this. So you agree government. that there may be systemic racism? To the extent, in, in, in where? where? Uh, let me continue my line of questioning. I, I don't agree that there's systemic racism in the police department. Specifically. Generally in this country. And I'm reclaiming my time, Mr. General. Specifically, do you understand the violent impact of racial profiling? And do you support the in racial profiling, uh, racial and religious profiling in the George Floyd bill? including the removal uh, of the strict interpretation of qualified immunity, which would leave individuals like Breonna Taylor and George Floyd without any relief at all. 
No, I'm opposed to eliminating qualified immunity, and I don't agree that it would leave uh, the victims of police misconduct. Well, let me share with you some aspects. Without, without any remedy at all. I'm reclaiming my time. Let me share with you some aspects of uh, profiling. After the death of George Floyd found that while black people make up 19% of the Minneapolis population and 9% of its police, they were on the receiving end of 58% of the city's police use of force incidents. In addition, uh, we've seen uh, that uh, black men are twice as likely to be stopped and searched. Hispanic drivers, 65% to receive a ticket. Uh, and Native Americans in Arizona, three times more likely to search and be stopped. Let me ask you the questions of how we respond to that. The Justice Department has many tools at its disposal to reduce police violence, to patent or practice investigations, a practice to end bad policing and, pl and police violence. It addresses police violence at an institution level rather than just focuses on acute cases. If you understand that, then why has your department only pursued one pattern or practice investigation since President Trump took, took office that could stop systemic racism? The, if, if you read my statement or listened to my statement, I, I did specifically acknowledge that uh, there was a difficulty in this country uh, with the African American community. Mr. Attorney General, I have a short time. Well, Can you just I, tell like me why you have answer, not answer done question. a pattern in practice? What uh, was the reason? Uh, and you asked me what I thought the response was, and I thought the response to this is, in fact, training of police. Uh, and uh, I think the police believe that that's a response. I was talking to a black then let chief me continue. of police. Mr. Who, Attorney General, I, I want to respect you, but I have a short time. You, you, for example, 18 U.S.C. Section 242, which makes unlawful the denial of rights under the color of law. Can you defend the fact that in the first seven months of FY 2020, federal prosecutors filed only 242 charges, 242 charges in just 27 cases in the Trump DOJ? And were you aware uh, that in FY 2019, federal prosecutors brought two, Section 242 charges in just 49 cases in the United States? And do, are you aware of how many cases we've had, 184,274? Which means that in FY 2019, only about 27 out of every 100,000 prosecutions was related to Section 242 charges. Do you have a reason for that? Yeah. Yes, I do. Uh, I will get you the numbers on it. I don't know them off the top of my head. But actually, our criminal prosecutions under 241 and 242 are, are extremely strong and are comparable to, if not exceed, prior administrations. But at the beginning of this year, most of the uh, – very few jurisdictions had grand juries that were open. No grand jury. I think the reason is because it was really skinny. It was not your focus. Your focus was more to – let out friends like Roger Stone and Paul Manafort, while Tamir Rice, whose case has not been taken up, was playing with a toy gun, was killed by police at the age of 12. Breonna Taylor was sleeping in her apartment when she was killed by police at age 26. And Rashad Brooks, 27, was killed just for sleeping uh, in his car in a Wendy's parking lot. And George Floyd from Houston, Texas, known as a humble man, was murdered in the streets of Minneapolis crying, I can't breathe. Uh, I would hope that the DOJ would focus on systemic institutional racism because there is good policing. That's what we're trying to do in the Justice and the Judiciary Committee, and that's what we need you to join us on, Mr. Attorney General, and to recognize that institutional racism does exist, and until we accept that, we will not finish our job and reach the goals and aspirations of our late, iconic John Lewis. The, With that, I yield back. The gentlelady yields back, Mr. Uh, Gomer. Attorney General Barr, uh, we've been hearing about these peaceful protests in major cities around the, the country, controlled by Democratic mayors and city councils. You've had a lot of experience. Have you ever seen so many people hurt, injured, and killed at peaceful protests in your life? Uh, I, I, I haven't seen it, no, not at a peaceful protest. Uh, obviously, as I've said from the beginning, these peaceful protests ha in many places are being hijacked by a, a very hardcore of, of uh, instigators, violent instigators. And they, they become violent, and their primary uh, viol uh, direction of violence is to injure police. Police, well, police casualties far exceed anything uh, you know, on the civilian side. 
Weren't there over 50 police injured in uh, Chicago just in the recent days? It, and now I'm hearing this allegation that this administration uh, is helping spread uh, coronavirus, COVID-19, and, and yet these are some of the same people that just castigated the president for shutting down travel from the location where the virus was coming from. And now it's something more interested in defending the Chinese Communist Party than they are our own country. But uh, what occurred to me, hearing this allegation about this administration helping spread COVID, uh, would it be a good idea then perhaps if that's the big concern here uh, that maybe the federal government should shut down the protests during this COVID-19 uh, spread so that we can satisfy our colleagues that you're doing more to stop it? Has that ever been a consideration? No, I, I've never considered that. <laughs> well, it would apparently stop uh, some of the allegations being thrown here. Uh, now, I know you know history. Uh, Going back to 1917, the Bolshevik Revolution, the Mao Revolution, uh, some of these tactics we're seeing are not new. Trying to get even David Horowitz, I introduced one time as a former socialist, he said, no, I was a full-blown communist. But he has pointed out that he started looking away from the group he was in because he saw they were interested in trying to provoke the police to kill somebody so that they could really create mayhem. You're familiar with that tactic by Marxists, are you not? Yes. It is a dangerous time. Well, let me ask you, uh, I know you know that uh, U.S. attorneys are supposed to serve at the pleasure of the president. You know, Bill Clinton fired 93 U.S. attorneys on the same day uh, do you know what made U.S. Attorney Berman think that he was the exception who did not serve at the pleasure of the president? What caused him to think he owned that position? <clears throat> I think part of it was he seems to have had the view that because he was court appointed and there is a provision in law for court appointment of a U.S. attorney as essentially a placeholder until the administration hmm. uh, gets somebody uh, that he felt he could not be removed by the president yeah. because he was court appointed, and that's not correct. Yeah, and, and some um, judges fail to know what my constitutional law professor knew, and that is that all courts except federal courts except for one owe their existence and continuation and jurisdiction to the U.S. Congress. Uh, hopefully, uh, Mr. Berman will figure that out at some point. Now, uh, is Bruce Orr still working for the FBI? He works for the Department of Justice. Uh, well, we have heard so much information about he's basically being the go-between between the DNC, the Clinton campaign, Fusion GPS, Christopher Steele, the Russian propaganda that uh, were incorporated into his dossier. And I know... Klein Smith, uh, Christopher Ray indicated he had been um, given the chance to resign, go get a better job. I'm wondering how long Bruce Orr is going to be staying where he is. It's incredible to me that he's still there. Well, I can't talk about, you know, individual personnel matters. Well... Thank you for your service. I'm sorry for the abuse you've taken when you're just trying to do your job. Appreciate it very much. You're back. The gentleman's time has expired. The chair recognizes the gentleman from Tennessee for five minutes. Thank you, Madam Chair. Mr. Barr, I'm the chairman of the subcommittee on the Constitution, Civil Rights, and Civil Liberties, so this is most pertinent hearing to me. Firstly, I'd like to ask you if you will... Uh, work with us and allow the head of the Civil Rights Division, Assistant Attorney General Eric uh, Dryband, to testify before this committee this fall. I'll talk to him about it. We encourage him? I'll talk to him about it. All right. I've closely watched actions taken by the federal government in Lafayette Park in June and currently in Portland, Oregon. According to a DOJ document dated June 4, received by this committee, 
1,500 federal agents from 10 different agencies were deployed to confront protesters in Washington, D.C. At Lafayette Park, which has long been honored and accepted as a place of protest in our nation's capital, on the first day of June, the world watched in horror on live television as federal agents deployed by the administration and with you present and telling him to get it done, used force to clear Lafayette Park so that the president, with you and others at your side, could walk across the park and have a photo op in front of St. John's Church. This was anathema to the bishop of the diocese and the rector of the church. It was also an affront to the Constitution and to the American people. Given the timing and the coordinated attack against the peaceful demonstrators, it strains credulity that this was not planned for use of political purposes. And just yesterday, Major DeMarco testified to another committee of Congress that the protesters were peaceful, and that's what the, ma most, the majority of people have said, and the response was excessive. When did you first learn that the president planned to walk through the park and go to St. John's Church? First, I'd like to respond to what you Let, Would you please answer my question? My time is limited. I learned uh, sometime in the afternoon that the president uh, might come out of the White House, and then later in the afternoon I heard that he might go over to the church. So it was absolutely necessary the park be cleared for his for his. Board. No, that's, that had nothing to do with that. The plan to move. Mr. Mr. The plan General, to move the it was necessary that the park be cleared, and it was done. And you said, get it done. Well, I, I, I have the time. Thank you. In Portland, we've seen mothers and we've seen veterans who were peacefully protesting, not threatening the federal courthouse, beaten and gassed. Unidentified armed federal agents violently attacked demonstrators in a violation of the First Amendment's freedom of assembly and arrested citizens without individualized suspicion in a violation of the Fourth Amendment's protection against unreasonable searches and seizures and a warrant requirement. You've gone through the Fifth Amendment and due process and just negated it. And the Tenth Amendment, which leaves general policing to the law enforcement, to the states, has been forgotten. Maybe what happened was your secret police were poorly trained, just like your Bureau of Prisons guards were poorly trained and allowed the most notorious inmate in our nation's last several years, Jeffrey Epstein, to conveniently commit suicide. It's sad. You misled Congress and the American people about Special Counsel Mueller's findings with your, quote, summary, unquote, of his report. It was issued about a month before you released the redacted portion of the Mueller report. But you set the stage. You set the stage such that the Special Counsel objected to the accuracy of how it was reported by the press and what you said. And Federal Judge Reggie Walton, appointed by George W. Bush, declared in a ruling that your summary was, quote, distorted, unquote and misleading, unquote, and that the court could not trust you. Further, Judge Walton stated the report was, quote, a calculated attempt to influence public disclosure about the Mueller report in favor of President Trump, unquote. This committee still does not have the unredacted Mueller report. America has still not seen the unredacted Mueller report. Your excuses for not releasing it because it had to do with ongoing cases no longer exist because those ongoing cases have been completed or commuted or finished. Other attorney generals work with this Judiciary Committee to see that the American public and that the Judiciary Committee had unredacted copies of that report. You have not. You've gone to court to stall it. This report needs to be given to this committee. In Michael Cohen, you've treated him differently than Michael Flynn and Roger Stone. In Michael Flynn, you've attempted to dismiss the charges, even after he twice pled guilty. And at Roger Stone, you went further. Mr. Barr, John Lewis said to us, if not me, who, if not now, when? That's why I introduced H.R.S. 1032, which would require this committee to investigate your conduct as Attorney General and determine whether you should be impeached. That is my constitutional duty. I yield back the balance of my time. May I respond to these? I have seek recognition. I'm sorry, what did you... I would, the, like to to, I would like to Mr. seek Cohen. recognition for unanimous consent requests. Yes. You are Thank recognized. you. I'd like to introduce for the record a Slate article entitled Why Trump Chose Portland, which describes the racial history of the state and the Portland Police Bureau. I'd also like to introduce an op-ed from Mary McCord, who writes her words were twisted to justify the department's disingenuous position to drop charges against Michael Flynn after he had already pled guilty. I'd like to introduce an op-ed from Jonathan Cravis, 
describing the political interference in the Roger Stone case and why he resigned from the Department of Justice. And I'd like to introduce a statement from over 2,600 former DOJ officials calling for Attorney General Barr's resignation because of his assault on the rule of law. And a letter from the New York City Bar urging Congress to commence formal inquiries into a pattern of conduct by Attorney General Barr that threatens public confidence in the fair and impartial administration of justice. And finally, a letter from 27 of the District of Columbia's most prominent attorneys and law professors, including four past presidents of the D.C. Bar, calling for an ethics investigation into Mr. Barr's conduct. With and that last objection. but not least, a letter from over 80 percent of the George Washington University Law School faculty, your alma mater, saying his actions have posed to continue to create a clear and present danger to the even-handed administration of justice, to civil liberties, and the constitutional order. Okay. Without objection. Thank Madam you. Chair, one more the unanimous consent request Go ahead. on this Go side. Ahead. This is the article that says, Representative Jerry Natler says Antifa violence in Portland is a myth. That's from Politico and a number of other journals. Without that objection. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Collins is recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Madam Chair. Welcome, Attorney General Barr. Wow. I, I'm beginning to believe, frankly, that you're probably the, that just hadn't come out yet, probably will in a little bit, you're probably the cause of the common cold and, uh, you know, and possibly even the COVID-19, I'm not sure at this point, because everything's being thrown at you, including now, undoubtedly, your alma mater doesn't like you anymore. Where, where have we come? The chairman said something earlier today that really made me think. He said, why all the drama? That's the most ironic statement coming from this committee in the last 18 months that I've ever heard of, the drama that we're bringing up today. We're, we're, we're seeming to just contort ourselves to get to uh, some way to show that you have nefarious motive. I believe, uh, like some of our side here, I believe the biggest problem you have is telling the truth. I believe that's the problem that they have with you. You'll tell the truth, and you'll take it responsibility for your actions, and I think that's why you're being attacked. But I want to continue just on this, quote, peaceful protest for a second. You made a comment just a second ago on these rights. Talking about the courthouses just down the street, what if they decided, do you think that this body right here would rise up if they decided to go tonight and paint the Capitol building? This body, I'm not sure. I think this side would. I'm not sure. <laughs> uh, yeah, this side, other side, I'm not so sure. It may be the peaceful protest to burn down the Capitol. Maybe we're back to 1812 again. Yeah. But also, the other question I have is, and you've heard it earlier today, the stormtrooper comments by the Speaker of the House. And we know that that is a direct uh, reference to the paramilitary wing of the Nazi party. Stormtroopers going at it. Do you believe that that actually puts our law enforcement community at a whole? As a son of a state trooper, I, I, I want to know your opinion. Is it, don't you think it encourages the violence that we're seeing and encourages the participation against the police? I think that's possible, and I think it's irresponsible to call these federal law enforcement officers stormtroopers. Yeah, and we're seeing that thing played out over and over. Let's switch back to something else, though, that is, is I think, more appealing here. We've talked about the investigations, and uh, especially going with Flynn. Do you believe that there was actually a basis to go after General Flynn? I mean, what we've seen so far, what's been released, and especially keeping a, an investigation open, Peter Strzok kept it open. Do you believe there's actually a basis for the beginning of this investigation to start with or continuing it? Well, I would just say, I, I asked uh, another U.S. attorney in St. Louis who had 10 years in the FBI and 10 years in the Department of Justice as a career prosecutor to take a look at it, and, and he determined based on documents that had not been provided to Flynn's side and not been provided to the court that, in fact, there was no basis to investigate okay. Flynn. And well, furthermore, it was clearly established by the documents that the FBI agents who interviewed him did not believe right. that he thought he was lying. Well, there's another part of this as well that concerns uh, what has been you know, given to the courts and, and the interviews, and that is that the facts were not disclosed to Flynn prior to the interview. We're talking, do you, that seems like a Brady violation to me. Do you believe that, that was, there's a Brady violation there in this case? No, there wasn't a Brady been. violation there, but I think what the uh, counsel concluded was that the only purpose of the interview, the only purpose, was to try to catch him in, in saying something that they could then say was a lie. So it was an entrapment. And therefore, and, and therefore there was not a, a legit, the, the interview was untethered to any legitimate uh, investigation. So as the law, law enforcement officer in this country, it is your responsibility to provide justice for both sides, not, you know, and, and just call it as it should be. And I think that's what you've done there. Uh, continuing on Durham case, and I know we're not talking specifically about the Durham investigation, which we're hopeful of, but to your knowledge, uh, um, and we're seeing some released documents in the last uh, week or two that have said, to your knowledge, has Kevin Kleinsmith or anyone else at FBI or DOJ attempted who was previously there, attempted to redeem themselves by cooperating with the investigation. It's been slow, and I'm I, just wondering. I can't get into that. Okay. I understand that. Well, I have another issue as we finish up in looking at this between the rhetoric, between the investigation, I think Durham, 
investigation is something most of us are waited for because we can't seem to get this committee to actually believe that the IG's report is worth having something about this committee. And there's not a Democrat or Republican on the side that can make a legitimate claim why the Inspector General has not been called before this committee to actually explain his report except politics. And that's what this committee has become all along. But I have another problem, and I've talked to you, I've written to you about this, um, and that's down with a district attorney down in Fulton County, Georgia, actually charging, uh, making felony murder charges uh, on an officer. And the interesting part about this is what we do as, as, as prosecutors do, but the, were you aware that the district attorney failed to seek an indictment from a grand jury or even waited for a GBI investigation to finish before bringing those charges? Were you aware of that? Yes, I was. Okay. As an attorney, and again, looking at this, with the, the environment we have right now with police officers constantly under attack from, from this committee and from others in all over the country, and especially from the Speaker of the House, as an attorney and especially a prosecutor, do you think it's appropriate to charge a law enforcement officer with a crime as severe as felony murder without giving the investigation more than a mere days and without obtaining a, an indictment from the grand jury? And while you announce the charges, lay out a case that is full of falsehoods. I've said that I, I would have preferred and, uh, that he had used the grand jury and had waited till the Georgia Bureau had completed its investigation. Well, I appreciate your help in that, and with that, I yield back. Thank you. With that, the chair recognizes... Uh, Mr. Johnson from Georgia. Thank you. Uh, General Boyd, your opening statement reads like it was written by Alex Jones or Roger Stone. Do you oh. stand by that statement? Yes. Now, I'm sure that we can agree on some things. We disagree on a whole lot, but I'm sure we can agree on the fact that President Trump is just a prolific tweeter. Isn't that correct? He seems to be. And he tweeted many times about the Roger Stone sentencing, didn't he? I don't know how many times he tweeted about well, it. Well, many times. You, and you are aware of them because you said it would it's, hurts you from doing your job. And isn't it true that when prosecutors in the Roger Stone case filed a memo with the court recommending a sentence of seven to nine years in prison, a few hours later, President Trump tweeted that the sentence recommendation was, quote, a disgrace. You're aware of that? Yes. In General Barr, several hours after that, you filed a pleading with the court stating that the sentence recommendation would be changed and that you would be asking for a lighter sentence for Roger Stone. Isn't that correct? No, but, no what is correct is that well, er, 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 what is correct that on February 10th, Monday, no, no, I gave no, instructions no, no. as to what the... Reclaiming my time. Yeah, reclaiming I'm answering your question. Well, you got to let him answer. Re reclaiming my time, you filed a sentencing recommendation hours after President Trump tweeted his dissatisfaction with the Stone recommendation, and you changed that recommendation. No, I direct, the night before, the, Trump the night before... That is well, Monday I, night. I know your story, but I'm asking. Well, you. I'm telling my story. That's well, what I'm here to do. To tell you well, I do. I That's why I'm here. My question. And well, I'm here to tell my story. Well, and on the night before, the night before on February 10th, oh, sir, on February I, 10th, I directed. Reclaiming my time, sir. Reclaiming my time. And I know you don't want to answer, but the facts are clear. Sentencing recommendation made in the morning, tweet. In the afternoon, you changed the sentencing recommendation that... No, the tweet, tweet was not made in the afternoon. Tweet. The tweet was made at, I think, 1.30 or 2 in the morning. Well, the tweet was made before and after. Tweet tweeted about that relentlessly, and you've agreed to that. Now, when you filed your sentencing recommendation asking for a lower sentence... I didn't ask for a lower sentence. Well, you said that you were going to recommend a lower sentence... And you no, I let, what, we, wasn't the sentence that was recommended by the line prosecutors according to the sentencing guideline calculations? It was within it was within the guidelines, but it was not within Justice so, Department policy, so in now, my view. General Barr, you're expecting the American people to believe that you did not do what Trump wanted you to do when you changed that sentencing recommendation and lowered it for Roger Stone. You think the American people don't understand that you were carrying out Trump's? I was not. I, I had not discussed my sentencing recommendation with anyone at the White House or anyone, the president, exactly. or anyone or anyone outside the, the department. You to do, and that's what you did. No, 
Let me ask you, do you think it's fair? Do you think it is fair for a 67-year-old man to be sent to prison for seven to nine years? It was in accordance with the sentencing. No, it was not. You just said that it was, and your line prosecutors will testify that it was also. Now, I'm going to move on from that. The department your time as attorney it is not the department Herbert Walker Bush, you never changed the sentencing recommendation for a friend of uh, Herbert Walker Bush, did you? No, I, as I recall. All right. I, uh, that's all I'm asking. Not, no. And over the course of your time as Trump. It was, nothing was never elevated to me. Over the course of your tenure with Trump, you've changed two sentencing recommendations. Not one, but two. Which Correct? Were, which were they? Yeah, Michael Flynn. I didn't change it. Well, you said, well, you indicated that um, you, yeah, you changed it because the original Flynn sentencing recommendation was for Flynn to serve zero to six months. But under your authority, the Justice Department supplemented that recommendation with a pleading that stated the Department of Justice's agreement with Flynn's lawyers that probation would be a reasonable sentence and that the DOJ would not be sinking prison time for Michael Friend. Isn't that correct? I don't think that's what it said. Well, that's what it said, sir. You go back and read it. I, I, now, think, prior, both, I think both pleadings sir, said that... Reclaiming my time prior to you becoming... The gentleman's time Chair. has expired. Madam Chair, you, you, can, you can give a speech or you can ask questions. If you do the latter, you need to let the witness answer the questions. And that's the chair's obligation, and chair's responsibility to allow that to happen. Mr. Buck is recognized for five minutes. General Barr, thank you for appearing before the committee today. General Barr, there is a disturbing pattern we've seen throughout history with totalitarian systems of government. The leaders first seek to disarm the population, then they encourage goon squads to suppress opposing voices. And finally, once they have disarmed and silenced the opposition, these authoritarian leaders institute policies that root out and crush freedom in every form. Unfortunately, the American left has been infected with the same totalitarian desire to remove firearms and silence opposing views as part of a campaign to achieve its political ends. We've seen this scenario play out in every major Democrat-run city in America. Progressive leaders push to disarm law-abiding Americans to further their influence while watching as crime rates soar. We even saw failed presidential and Senate candidate Beto O'Rourke proudly tell Americans, hell yes, we're going to take your AR-15 and your, AR, or your AK-47. Now the American left is actively cheering as its fascist militia, Antifa, rages in the streets. Antifa is a domestic terrorist organization that hijacks peaceful rallies, organizes armed riots, attacks peaceful protesters, burns buildings, loots stores, and spreads hate. Reports of Antifa-linked attacks began circulating in 2017. These thugs, often armed with sticks and pepper spray and other, uh, other instruments, showed up to silence college Republican groups at Berkeley. The left was silent. Then in June 2019, Antifa jumped into the national conversation after journalist Andy Ngo was brutally attacked in Portland. No arrests were made. The left again was silent. Almost exactly one year ago today, the Wall Street Journal ran an op-ed stating Portland has to do something to deter political violence or the city will get more of it. Of course, the city's feckless leadership has only further encouraged Antifa's violent annex. As a result, we've seen 61 straight nights of violence in Portland. Antifa's fascist totalitarian activities are now oozing into other Democrat-run cities. Last Sunday, Antifa launched a violent assault on a peaceful pro-police demonstration in Denver, Colorado. Conservative leaders in Colorado, including Randy Corcoran, a Denver area lawyer and radio talk show host, organized a family-friendly event in honor of Law Enforcement Appreciation Day. The atmosphere was peaceful, and a counter-protesters were given plenty of space to advocate their message. But as the afternoon wore on, a swarm of violent Antifa thugs infiltrated the peaceful Black Lives Matter counter-protesters and began assaulting pro-police Americans. These are 20- and 30-year-old thugs assaulting 50, 60, 70, and even 80-year-old Americans who only wanted to show their support for law enforcement. What's worse, Denver's cowardly liberal leadership ordered police to retreat 
once they saw members of Antifa entering the fray. A Denver police detective, Nick Rogers, apologized for this terrible decision. Detective Rogers summed it up best in a recent radio interview, quote, I'm sorry on behalf of the rank and file. That's not us. That's not who we are. It just kills me that we let good people down. He continued, I found out that a retreat order was given by the incident commander, and we had one lieutenant step up and say, we aren't leaving. This lieutenant said, these people are going to get killed if we don't stay. So he kept his people there. That's the reason this thing didn't get worse. End of quote. These are sad times in America. Free speech and the right to keep and bear arms are both being threatened by violent anarchists, and the best our chairman can do is call Antifa a myth. General Barr, this has to stop. We can't let Antifa continue terrorizing our country. Can you please tell us about the appropriate use of civil and criminal RICO statutes to address violent criminal groups like Antifa? In the, uh, in the wake of the, the beginning of these riots, um, I asked our joint terrorism task forces, the FBI's joint terrorism task forces around the country, uh, to uh, be our principal means of developing evidence and prosecuting uh, violent extremist terrorists who are involved in these activities. And one of the tools, obviously, we would use is RICO, which can be used against an organization. But that doesn't mean that we currently have a RICO case uh, pending. Okay. I, I thank the uh, gentleman. And, and uh, do you have anything you want to say in response to the speeches that have been given by the other side and, and then you've been cut off? Yeah, well, let's on Lafayette. On Lafayette. The gentleman's time has expired. Can I ask for the, a brief recess? Yeah, Madam Chair, the witness like a. Break. Yes. Mr. Mr. Barr, Mr. Barr, ten, ten minutes. minutes for a brief. Ten minutes. Five. Okay. Recess for five. Minutes. We're the committee will stand in recess for five minutes. The committee's in recess, sir.
committee is in session. Uh, the chair recognizes Mr. Deutsch for five minutes. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, Attorney General Barr, uh, you just told us that nothing was ever elevated to me. You had said in an interview recently that there's a process in place, an escalation system. It's the AG's responsibility to resolve it. How is this elevated to you, the case of Roger Stone? Uh, on Monday, February 10th, the U.S. Attorney uh, was with me, and he raised the issue with me. So it was he elevated was by Timothy Shea? Yes. And um, had it been elevated uh, during the two months between the time the conviction came in under the former U.S. Attorney and, uh, and the time that Timothy Shea started? I, I think Shea may have had conversations with people. In the now, did you ever have of, conversations with a former U.S. attorney about this case, about the sentencing? Stone. I, I, I don't recall any discussion about Stone. With, right. With so, Stone. Timothy Shea, you said in the interview that he was new. He had just started. Um, he's, he was new, but he worked for you for a long time, didn't he? Yes. And what was his job for you? Well, when I was attorney general 30 years ago, he worked. No, 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 no now, just, just now. He was, he was on my staff. He advised you on, on criminal justice policy and law enforcement, right? Correct. And you, act, you named him acting U.S. attorney. Uh, had you discussed the Stone case with him before you named him acting U.S. attorney? No. Did you discuss sentencing with him? Not before. The first time was when he came in. It wasn't Monday, actually, to just to refresh your recollection. In a prior interview, you said he came in the week before. He came in to see some senior staff. That's what I, no, that's what I said. He may have he may have had discussions right. with people in the deputy's office. I was not involved in those discussions. Basically, I didn't, uh, as far as I can recall, I had no substantive involvement in Stone until that Monday when he came in in the morning. Well, the I'm sorry, Mr. Attorney General. The week before when he came in to see the the senior staff that I, he had worked with the week before when he was working. On no, I said staff. I said I think he had raised it with people in the deputy's office. That's senior staff too. Right, I understand. He, but I was not involved. He in started that. on he started on July 31st. The first week he was there, he came to raise this issue. I think he started February 1st. Right. Yeah. The yeah. first week he was there, he came into your office to raise the issue of sentencing. Um, in the interview you did with ABC, you said no, you never. No, I, I don't think he. he that's what, you, that's what you told ABC News. You said that he's talked to senior staff. Not you, perhaps, but he talked to senior staff. That, I, I, I don't, I don't know. What, to... You know, I think I speak English. I said that before he came in to see me, I believe he had some conversations. Conversations with, with senior staff. staff. Right. That's right. Before he okay. came to see you. We're saying the same thing. But, I but, just the, asked, but the first it was raised with me. Was on Monday. Was on Monday. Did you talk to the senior staff after they spoke with him? I think at a 9 o'clock meeting, uh, they said that uh, he was trying to work something out on sentencing, and, and he was actually optimistic that something could be worked out. So I didn't really and, think of it as an issue until that Monday when he told me that right. the so then prosecutors. He, so then he filed, so then they filed, he filed the sentencing uh, memo, and the sentencing memo called for seven to nine years. It's the policy of the U.S. Attorney's Office to suggest a specific guideline range, which, um, which they did. And then you overruled the line prosecutors. They asked for a lower sentence, um, and you gave some reasons. You talked about health. Health is to be considered only for an extraordinary physical impairment. Did that apply to Roger Stone, Mr. Uh, Attorney General? Actually, That's what the guidelines said. That's well, actually, I, I can't, you know, I can't reveal all the information. I just, you, I'm not asking what his health was, but did that apply? No. Okay. Uh, and did, did what, and sorry, said, did what apply? His health. Is that the health, reason? Health is a reason to. Take I know. Is that the account. case? Is that the reason for Roger Stone? That or you're asking for a lower sentence. Let me go on. It says I age. Why. Let me go on. Let me I go on. Age, why I hold on one second. Age can be consideration. It says only if it creates conditions that are of an unusual degree and distinguish the case from typical cases. He was 67. Did the that judge agreed with me, Congressman. No, that's not the what judge I'm asking. I'm with not me. asking you that. The Mr. judge Trump. agreed I'm with me. I'm not asking whether. I know you're not. I'm asking, not asking I'm you that. Saying. And the issue here is the issue here is whether Roger Stone was treated differently because he was friends with the president. When you asked that, when you asked to reduce the sentence, you said enhancements were technically applicable. Mr. Attorney General, can you think of any other cases? where the defendant threatened to kill a witness, threatened to threaten a judge, lied to a judge, where the Department of Justice claimed that those were mere technicalities. Can you think of even one? The judge agreed with our analysis. Can you think of even one? I'm not asking about the judge. I'm asking about what you did to reduce the sentence of, of Roger Stone. I, yes. Can I'm, you think, Mr. Are, Attorney General, 
He threatened the life of a witness. And the witness and said he didn't feel threatened. And you view that as a technicality, Mr. Attorney General. The, 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 has, the witness, is there another time that happened? Can I answer the question? Happened? Can I have just a few seconds to answer sure, the question? I'm asking if okay. there's another time in, in this all case, the time of the Justice the Department. Judge, the judge agreed with our— You won't our, answer my question, the Mr. Judge Attorney agreed General. And it's unfortunate. And it, the appearance is that, as you said earlier, this is exactly what you want. The essence of rule of law is that we have one rule for everybody. And we right. don't in this case because he's a friend of the president's. I yield back. The chairman the, yields back, Mr. Uh, Ms. Roby. Mr. Attorney General, thank you so much for being here with us today. Um, I'm a member of both this committee as well as the Appropriations Committee, and I've been able to see firsthand um, both the funding and the operation of the department. Um, additionally, before I was elected to Congress, I served on the city council in my hometown of Montgomery, Alabama. And I've witnessed the importance and the value of various Justice Department grant programs and the resources to state and local governments. For example, the Alabama Fusion Center, uh, which is designed to combine information between federal, state, and local government, private sector entities, and the intelligence community um, has been a recipient of these federal grants. And the Alabama Fusion Center is also responsible for the Alabama Center for Missing and Exploited uh, Children and has done a great job um, in work in combating um, child exploitation. Do you believe that Congress is adequately funding programs that provide state and local agencies with the tools that they need uh, to be effective in preventing and pursuing crimes such as child exploitation and human trafficking, um, particularly over the Internet? I think we could always use more re resources for that, Congressman. But, but if I could just have a moment of your time to respond to these questions sure. here on uh, that were being asked about this, the uh, Roger Stone sentencing. The... Uh, U.S. attorney came to me and said that the four aligned prosecutors were threatening to resign unless they could recommend seven to nine years. Uh, but there was no comparable case to support that. It would have been a very disparate sentence. All the cases were clustered around three years sentence for that. And the way they had gotten to the seven to nine was by applying an enhancement. And there, and there are debates all the time within the Department of Justice about the proper calculations under the guidelines and whether a particular enhancement applies or doesn't apply. And those are usually uh, worked out and resolved. But here they were saying that they were taking an enhancement that has traditionally been applied to mafioso and things like that, threatening a witness, and they were applying it to him because he had a phone call at night where he told a witness that if you want to get it on, let's get it on and, and I'll take your dog. And uh, we felt that that technically could apply, but in this case, it really didn't reflect the underlying conduct. And the overarching requirement at the Department of Justice is that we do not presume and automatically apply the guidelines. We make individual assessments of the defendant and what is really just under the case and nothing that is excessive. And uh, these individuals were trying to force the U.S. attorney uh, who was new in the office, to adopt seven to nine. And I made the decision, no, uh, we are going to uh, leave it up to the judge. And that later, when that was not done, that evening, I told people we had to go back and correct that the next morning. So that, that's the sequence of events. But at the end of the day, the proof of the pudding is in the, uh, in the eating. The judge said she would not have gone along, she didn't think, with the first recommendation because the enhancement artificially inflated the exposure of the defendant. And she came out exactly where I had come out. So at the end of the day, the question is fairness to the individual. And uh, even though I was going to uh, get a lot of criticism I, at the end of the, uh, for, for doing that, uh, I think at the end of the day, my obligation is to be fair to the individual. Thank you for permitting me. Yeah, I'm happy to, to have yielded you uh, time to respond. Uh, that being said, um, Mr. Attorney General, um, as I am a departing member of Congress and have just a few short moments left, I just want to express to you 
uh, in the department how important this issue that I originally asked you about is to me, both as a member of Congress representing my constituents in Alabama, but also as a mother of two beautiful children. And I am increasingly alarmed um, about the way that children are just one click away from um, being on a website, a forum, or a chat room, or a social media site while, where bad actors uh, may be lurking. And whereas I only have a few short seconds left, I would just ask you in the time that I have left in Congress that we could continue to work together um, to combat um, child exploitation and uh, human trafficking. And I appreciate all the work that you're doing on this. Absolutely, Congresswoman. And, and as you know, one of the most difficult issues coming up is uh, encryption because as this material gets encrypted in the chat rooms and the areas where they groom these young children, uh, once it becomes encrypted, it'll be very hard for us to uh, police it. Right. Thank you so much. I yield back. Thank you. The gentlelady yields back. Ms. Bass. Uh, Attorney General Barr, when it comes to police engagement, last August when speaking to the National Fraternal Order of Police, you shared your views on police engagement with the public. You stated, and I quote, underscore the need to comply first, and if warranted, complain later. This will make everyone safe, the police, subject, the police sub suspects and the community at large, and those who resist must be prosecuted. I repeat, zero tolerance for resisting police. This will save lives. Do you stand by that statement? Yes, I think it's very important. A, a that zero tolerance attitude is costing lives, not saving them, especially in communities of Well, I'm not, I'm not saying uh, that. I reclaim I, my time. A movement and protests have arisen in response to police brutality. Here are a few examples of who bears the cost of zero tolerance. Elijah McLean was walking home from a convenience store when he was approached by police. He had not committed a crime. Police held him in a chokehold for 15 minutes, then injected him with cat catamine. Academy, not under a doctor's supervision, but at the direction of non-medically trained and unlicensed police officers. Are you familiar with that case? No. Do you know how frequently ketamine is used by law enforcement to subdue civilians, especially people of color? No. Did you know if police departments have been documented as directing paramedics and EMTs to eject ketamine during arrests? No. Um, have you, well then, I guess you haven't evaluated the use of force tactics by beca since becoming AG and especially this particular tactic of subdu subduing suspects with ketamine? Not with respect to ketamine, no. Will you commit to directing the department to evaluate the protocols around the use of ketamine, chokeholds, and other methods used by federal law enforcement officials when making arrests or detaining subjects? Well, absolutely. Under the president's executive order, we are reviewing uh, Thank you. And the especially, use of force and working good. with police departments. As, especially the ketamine. That's pretty outrageous. Ketamine. George Floyd was killed by a police officer via a chokehold. For eight minutes and 46 seconds, a police officer knelt on his neck as he, as he begged for his life. He was suspected of using a counterfeit $20 bill. That's how zero tolerance can amount to a death sentence for black men when used in communities of color. With George Floyd screaming, as we all know, he couldn't breathe. Now consider James Holmes, who murdered 12 people and injured 70 others in a movie theater in Aurora, Colorado, the same town as Elijah McLean, where he was arrested. James wore body armor, had a knife, semi-automatic weapons, and an AR-15. Yet he was calmly arrested by the same police department as Elijah McLean without a chokehold or an injection of ketamine. Dylan Roof used a gun to murder nine people and injured another at Emmanuel African Methodist Episcopal Church in South Carolina. When he was arrested, no chokeholds, no injections, he was treated so well that officers brought Dylan Roof Burger King after arresting him. Are you familiar with that case? Yes. I raised those two examples to follow up on what my colleague from Texas highlighted earlier, that the department is not doing enough to address issues of racism, bias, and brutality in law enforcement. When someone who commits mass murder is calmly arrested and served Burger King, while a young man walking down the street is placed in a chokehold and injected with ketamine, then dies. Uh, you said that uh, under the executive order, the administration is looking at chokeholds. What have you uh, determined so far? 
Well, we're, we're uh, setting up a system uh, of certification of police departments, and part of what our charter is is to come up with um, criteria that will be used for certification, including limitations on use of force, specifically including cho chokeholds. So in the George Floyd Justice and Policing Act, part of it called for a national registry of law enforcement officers as a resource for police chiefs to determine who are the best candidates for jobs. Uh, as you may or may not be aware, Tamir Rice might be alive today if, police, if the police chief who hired him had known that that police officer had been fired uh, from another department. What is your view of a national registry of law enforcement officers? Uh, the, the second aspect of the president's executive order is to set up a database like that so that all uh, determinations of excessive force around the country go into that database. And if police departments aren't reporting that information, they wouldn't be certified. So we do believe in one national point where you can go in and get uh, determinations of excessive force on uh, law enforcement candidates for jobs. Good, thank you. And, and I do want to uh, comment on part of your opening statement when you were saying that after the Jim Crow period that our justice system was equal. And um, I don't believe that, that that's I said the, the law, case. I said the laws were made equal. The laws are made equal. They are certainly not applied equally. Uh, we do have systemic problems in our law enforcement system, our criminal justice system on every level. The fact of the matter is 2.3 million people in the United States are incarcerated. We incarcerate 24% of the world's prisoners. 34% are black, while African Americans are just 13% of the, of the U.S. population. So justice is still not equal, nor are our laws. And I think when we look at how many people are incarcerated or how many people are killed, it is not the numbers. It is the percentage to the percentage of that group in the U.S. population. I yield back my time. The gentlelady, the gentlelady yields back. Uh, Mr. Gates. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Attorney General, you've described the prosecution of Roger Stone as righteous. That's clearly something that the President and I disagree with you on. Uh, I would suggest that perhaps the prosecution of Andrew McCabe, who lied four times, thrice under the penalty of perjury, would be more righteous. I would suggest to you that uncovering the criminal conspiracy that existed where people in our own government were trying to convince intelligence agents and operatives around the world to destabilize our elections and to discredit our president would perhaps be more righteous. But as we sit here today, I don't think that Mr. Stone or Mr. McCabe or any of those other folks are killing anyone or burning down our buildings. And so I'd like to focus our effort on the most acute need I believe our country has. You've recently said that you believe Antifa to be a terrorist organization. What's your basis for that belief? I, I, I'm not sure I said terrorist organization. I said we're investigating it as domestic terrorism. But uh, Antifa, there are a number of uh, violent extreme groups in the United States, and they're across the spectrum. Uh, Antifa is heavily represented in the recent riots. That's not to say they're the only group involved. Uh, and uh, they have been identified as involved in a number of the, of the violent mob actions that have taken place around the country. And Mr. Attorney General, I, I saw the chairman of the Judiciary Committee recently say that Antifa is a myth, that their involvement in this violence uh, isn't something that, that is real. What's your reaction to the chairman? Well, I don't think it's a myth. Uh, Antifa is, 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 uh, uh, can be best thought of, I think, as an as a, uh, umbrella term for what is essentially a movement comprised of uh, loosely organized groups around the country. In some, of these, in some areas of the country, there are a number of groups and there are sort of centers of activity. Uh, the groups, uh, as I say, are loosely organized, but they are definitely organized. Uh, but as, uh, since they have an, an anarchic temperament, they don't get along very well with each other. So I'm not suggesting it's a national organization that, that, that moves nationally. Uh, they tend to, to get organized for an event. And uh, there's a lot of uh, uh, 
organization right before an event occurs, but we see a lot of the organization during the, the mob violence. And, and that is a really important distinction when determining how to apply particularly our RICO laws to an organization like this. If Antifa is merely something that inspires people to go out and commit violence, that strikes me as legally distinct from Antifa being uh, an organizing influence to assist people in committing crimes. One question I get from my constituents is they watch the death and violence and disruption and chaos in Seattle and in Portland and in other places is whether or not there's a risk that that could metastasize to other areas of the country. Have you given consideration to the risk that might befall other American communities if the Department of Justice were not to take action to protect and preserve federal property in places like Portland? Yes, absolutely. You know, we are concerned about this problem metastasizing around the country. And, and so uh, we feel that we have to, uh, in a place like Portland, where even where we don't have the support of the, uh, the state, go the local government, uh, we have to take a stand and defend this federal property. We can't uh, get to a level where we're, we're going to accept these kinds of violent attacks on federal courts. And if you did what my Democrat colleagues were asking, if you merely abandoned that federal property, allowed it to be overrun, allowed the people inside to be harmed, is it your view then that Antifa and other violent people engaged in these acts would simply stop, would simply accept that as their sole victory? Or is it your expert opinion, having dealt with a number of law enforcement and criminal cases in your legal career, that, that they wouldn't stop, that they would go to the next town, to the next community, and potentially inspire more violence? There's no doubt in my mind that it would spread. And, and what comfort can you give Americans in my district and around the country that, that you will stop this, that you will stop the burning and destruction of federal property, and that you, will, that you will give confidence to regular Americans that they can go out in the streets without the risk of this terrorism? Well, as you can see in, in Portland, we have uh, a relatively small number of, of federal officers who have been withstanding this for almost two months. Uh, it's a great strain, but we, we cannot just stand aside and allow the federal court to be destroyed. Thank you for your service and for your great work. I yield back. The gentleman yields back, Mr. Richmond. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. <clears throat> Attorney General Barr, you started your testimony with eloquent words about the life and legacy of John Lewis fighting systematic racism, uh, voter intimidation, civil rights. Uh, the one thing that you have in common with your two predecessors, both Attorney General Sessions, and Attorney General Whitaker, is that when you all came here and brought your top staff, you brought no black people. That, sir, is systematic racism. That is exactly what John Lewis spent his life uh, fighting. And so I would just suggest uh, that actions speak louder than words, and you should really should keep the name of the Honorable John Lewis out of the Department of Justice's uh, mouth. Uh, let me also say, you mentioned bogus Russiagate. In your opinion, as the Attorney General of the United States of America, did Russia interfere or attempt to interfere in the 2016 election? Uh, yes. In your position as the Attorney General of the United States, is Russia attempting to interfere in the 2020 presidential election? Uh, I, think, I think we have to assume that they are. Thank you, sir. Uh, now, Let's talk about the integrity of the election, which is also uh, something Congressman Lewis uh, fought for. Jared Kushner implied that the president could move the election day. Can a sitting U.S. president move an election day? Actually, I haven't looked into that question under the Constitution. Well, 2 U.S. Code Section 7 says federal election day is the Tuesday after the first Monday in November. So if you take that as a correct statute, uh, is there any executive action by a president? I've never been asked the question before. I've never looked into it. As Attorney General of the United States, do you believe that this 2020 presidential election will be rigged? I have no reason to think it will be. Uh, president Trump tweeted uh, that the election will be rigged, but he also tweeted that when he was losing to Hillary Clinton, and he tweeted that the day after it was Fox showed that he was losing to Trump. But I don't want to be too political. Do you believe, as the Attorney General of the United States, that mail-in voting will lead to massive voter fraud? 
I think there's a high risk that it will. Do you ever vote, vote by mail-in ballot? Apparently I did once at least. But you believe that other people voting by mail could lead to massive fraud? No. What I've talked about, made very clear, is that I'm not talking about accommodations to people who have to be out of the state or have some particular need not to, uh, uh, inability to go and vote. What I'm talking about is the wholesale conversion of election to mail-in voting. You, you do understand that African Americans disproportionately do not survive COVID-19 coronavirus. You are aware of that. I didn't hear the question. You are aware that African Americans, black people, disproportionately die from COVID-19 coronavirus, correct? I th yes, I think that's right. And not that it would be uh, the first time that African Americans would risk their lives to vote in this country to preserve its democracy. Uh, but the suggestion is that them having the ability to vote by mail would somehow uh, lead to massive voter fraud. But I won't stick to that. No, I, I didn't say uh, that. I just uh, state, I think, what is a reality, which is that if you have wholesale mail-in voting, it substantially increases the risk of fraud. That's but it doesn't make it likely. That's all I said. Now, I also saw on TV that the president said he's not sure that he'll accept the election results. Can a president just protest because he lost an election? Protest in what sense? Well, can he contest an election just because he simply loses? Well, Gore versus you know, Bush v. Gore was... Well, I think that that was over uh, a slim voter margin. I'm talking about if it is very clear that the president has lost an election, uh, does he have a remedy to contest the election? Not that I'm aware of. Uh, let me go back to what uh, Representative Bass mentioned. You mentioned the number that there were eight African Americans killed by the police and 11 uh, white people killed by the police. So if, you, far if, this year. if you use those numbers... Uh, that's 85% of that population is white, 15% of that population is black. But if you actually look at the deaths according to the numbers you just gave, 42% of the deaths are African American and 58% are white. That is a glaring disparity in terms of population. And I just give you those numbers. Well, not, not necessarily. Because, because I have to adjust it by, who, by the, you know, the race of the criminal perpetrator. No, I, I just did that for you. I'm using your numbers, and according to your numbers, African Americans are four or five times more likely uh, than their percentage of the population to be killed by police than their no, white well, counterparts. The, the actual, so the, I, I just wanted to give you that based on your numbers. Actually, I, the studies I've seen have suggested two things. One, that in fact uh, police are less likely uh, to shoot at a black suspect, a little bit more likely to shoot at white. However, that black, that police are are more inclined to use non-lethal force in a uh, contact with an African American suspect. So those are the those in, in terms of the statistics. That's what it looks like to me. Any data that you have that shows that <clears throat> African Americans are less likely to die at the hands of police or be shot or shot at, uh, to me is a, a incorrect uh, analysis, but I am interested in seeing it. So if you have it, please see it. I won't call it any names, but if that data exists, I would be more than happy to see it. And since you're sending me that data, can you send me the data of African Americans within the Department of Justice, how many you have in leadership ranks all the way down? Thank you, and I yield back. The gentleman yields back. I would remind Mr. Jordan, Mr. Biggs, and Mr. Johnson, to stop violating the rules of the committee, to stop violating the safety of the members of the committee, to stop um, holding themselves out as not caring by refusing to wear their masks. Can we get the picture? Is, is it permissible it, to it, drink it is, sip it is coffee? It's not permissible. Not, not to drink. We can't drink I'm coffee ready to ask in the room now. I'm getting ready to ask Mr. questions. Mr. Um, and I will. <laughs> Mr. Gates is recognized. No, no, no. He's no it, went. He, he went, and that's why I took off my no, mask, my, Mr. My Chairman. Turn. My turn. I'm going to go. I'm going to go. Okay. Mr. Jordan is recognized. Mr. Attorney General, let's clear up a few things. Judge Berman Jackson agreed with your, uh, with your Stone sentencing recommendation. Is that right? That's right. Yeah. She said, I am concerned seven to nine years would be greater than necessary. I agree with the defense and with the government's second memorandum. So it couldn't be more clear they agreed with you. 
That's right. Lafayette Square. Would St. John's Church be standing today if you had not taken action? Well, I think uh, that was on Sunday. That was on Sunday night, and I think law enforcement did use tear gas. And my understanding is that night to clear the way so that the fire trucks could get in to to uh, save St. John's Church. D Church. That was on Sunday night, though. Understand. Understand the time frame. But it would would, you, would it be standing today if there had not been action taken by uh, federal law enforcement and local law enforcement? Right. 38 people unmasked Michael Flynn's name 49 times in a two-month time frame. Seven people at the Treasury Department unmasked Michael Flynn's name. Is this an issue that Mr. Durham is looking into? <clears throat> I've asked another U.S. attorney to look into the issue of unmasking because of, you know, the high number of unmaskings and some that do not readily appear to have been um, in the line of normal business. Wait a minute. That's what I want to be clear. So there is a there is another investigation on that issue specifically going on at the Justice Department right now. Yes. Wow, that's great. I, I, so Mr. Durham is looking at how the whole Trump Russia thing started. You have another U.S. attorney. Can you give us that U.S. attorney's name, or is that something you're comfortable doing? Or? John Bash of Texas. John Bash of Texas is looking specifically at the fact at unmasking 38 people, 49 times unmasked Michael Flynn's name and probably other unmaskings that took place in the final days of the Obama-Biden administration. Is that accurate? Actually, a much longer period of time. Even before that? Yes. Thank you, Mr. I, I appreciate that. And that's information that the committee did not, uh, did not know. Are peaceful protests violent, Mr. Attorney General? No. Do peaceful protests destroy businesses? No. Do peaceful protests injure officers? No. Do peaceful protests attack civilians? No. Do peaceful protests burn down buildings? No. I was, you know, the, the video we played, it's hard to watch. It's really hard to watch to see that happening in our great country. But there was one, the, the start of it was almost laughable where you have the reporter saying, as a building is burning behind him, it's not generally speaking an unruly protest. It's mostly just a protest. I mean, it's almost laughable when you have the reporter saying, I guess, I guess he's saying it's not a fire, it's just a burning building. I guess he's saying it's a peaceful burning building. Um, a few weeks ago, well, let me ask you this. I'm, I, I want to go right to this. Is defunding the police a rational policy? No, I, I think, if anything, uh, I'm more concerned that the, the police be adequately funded today and, and get more resources. A lot of the things we need to do to address uh, some of the concerns people have about what they saw in Minneapolis are going to take some resources, some of the training uh, that we have to do. And uh, one of the difficulties in our country, it's not a difficulty, it's a fact, we have 18,000 law enforcement agencies. Some, most of them are very, very small. And so we have to find a way of, of training, uh, you know, making sure the training is pushed out. Is it dangerous? Dangerous to defund the police? Extremely dangerous. Extremely dangerous. And some of the ordinances you're seeing cities pass are also dangerous. Are you familiar with the letter that Chief of Police of Seattle, Carmen Best, sent to business owners and residents in that city? Yes, I am saying that, you know, she cannot protect, uh, she can't do her job. Her police force cannot do the job because That's exactly of what she said. Yeah. Gives officers the po policy they're trying to pass. Thank goodness the court stopped it. The policy they're trying to pass gives officers no ability, and she emphasized no, not us, not, not you, Mr. Train, not me, gives officers no ability to safely intercede to preserve property in the midst of large, violent crowds. Mm -hmm. She also said in that letter, and again, she's, she's taken the leadership and responsibility to tell the business owners, the, the citizens, that she's supposed to serve. She also tells him in that letter, I've done my due diligence on informing the council numerous times. So she's saying, I tried to tell them these, these people won't listen to me. And then finally she says this, and this is the scary part. This is why it's so dangerous. She says this in her letter, Seattle police will have an adjusted deployment. That's a nice way of saying you're on your own. We can't help you. That is how scary this defund the police. And here's the kicker. Here's the kicker. These same cities sent you a letter last week, the same week uh, Chief of Police Best does this to the re residents and citizens of, of her city. Her mayor sends you a letter blaming you, blaming the federal government for the violence that is happening in these cities. That, that, that is how ridiculous the left's position has become. I appreciate the work you're doing, Mr. Attorney General. I'm, I'm over time. I yield back. Thank you. The gentleman yields to Mr. Jeffries. Uh, Mr. Barr, the job of the Attorney General 
is to defend the best interests of the people and serve as the people's lawyer. But during your time as Attorney General, you have consistently undermined democracy, undermined the Constitution, and undermined the health, safety, and well-being of the American people, all to personally benefit Donald Trump. Now, you just testified that there's no mechanism for a president to contest an election that has clearly been won by the opponent. Mr. Attorney General, what will you do if Donald Trump loses the election on November 3rd, but refuses to leave office on January 20th? If, well, if the results are clear, uh, I would leave office. Do you believe that there is any basis or legitimacy to Donald Trump's recent claim that he can't provide an answer as to whether he would leave office? I really am not familiar with these comments or the context in which they occurred, so I'm not going to give commentary on them. Okay, thank you. He just stated that publicly about a week ago to Fox uh, news. Mr. Barr, during a radio interview this spring with Hugh Hewitt, you praised President Trump's coronavirus response as superb, correct? Who did? You did. Okay. Over 150,000 Americans have died. More than 4 million Americans have been infected. More than 5 million Americans have lost their health care. Over 100,000 small businesses have permanently closed. More than 50 million Americans are out of work. This is not the outcome of superb leadership. What we've gotten from Donald Trump is exactly the opposite. Well, I, Let's explore. Well, I disagree with that. That, that. that was not a question. That was a statement. Let's explore. In February, President Trump falsely claimed that the number of coronavirus cases would go from 15 to zero in a few days. Was that superb? Yes or no? I, I'd have to see the context in which it was said. Here's the context. Well, the number what? of cases didn't go down to zero. It's over 4 million. Let's go to March. In that month, President Trump said, I take no responsibility at all for the failure in testing. Was that superb? Yes or no? It was accurate. The, 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 the problem with the testing system was a function of President Obama's mishandling of the CDC and his efforts to uh, centralize everything in the CDC when yeah. they could, didn't thank have you, the Thank you, Mr. Barr. That is inaccurate. That's a myth. It wasn't until this That's administration. It wasn't Claiming until my time. In April, President Trump irresponsibly suggested that the American people inject themselves with bleach. Was that superb? That's yes not, or no? That's not what I heard. That's exactly what he said. That's what the American people heard. And you know it. And you can't defend it. Let's move on to May. In that month, on National Nurses Day... President Trump falsely called PPE shortages fake news, while nurses and other healthcare professionals resorted to wearing trash bags and ski goggles to protect themselves. Fake news. Was that superb? Yes or no? I think the administration did a good job of, of mustering PPE and, and, and the national supply of PPE was run down during the Obama administration and never replaced. Thank you, Mr. Barr. The answer is no, it was not superb. By June, President Trump irresponsibly continued to refuse to wear a mask despite the public health guidance from his own experts. Was that superb? Yes or no? Which guidance? The earlier guidance that the masks wouldn't work? You know exactly the guidance that we're talking about. The CDC and Dr. Fauci in April recommended that the American people wear masks, but Donald Trump has become the poster boy for the anti-mask okay, movement. Donald, Donald Trump has probably tested more than any other human being on the face of yeah, the earth. Mr. As Barr, the answer is the refusal to wear a mask is not superb. Last question. In July, President Trump falsely claimed that 99% of COVID-19 cases are, quote, totally harmless. Was that superb? Yes or no? I think essentially what he was saying is that the, the fatality rate relatively is very low, very low. The answer is 150,000 Americans are dead. It has been a failure of epic proportions. In fact, Donald Trump's 
response to the coronavirus pandemic has been the worst failure of any president in American history. And the American people have paid the price. I yield back. Gentleman yields back. Who seeks recognition? Well, I'm, I guess I do. If it's, I think it's my turn to speak and ask questions. Is that correct, Mr. Chairman? Yes. Then I seek recognition, sir. Gentleman is recognized. Oh, bless your heart. Thank you. Um, Attorney General Barr, Chairman Nadler opened up his statement by saying you can no longer hide behind a legal fiction. That, that caused me some consternation. I had no idea what he was talking about. Do you have any idea what he's talking about? I don't recall that phrase in, in what context. Well, who, who knows what context? I mean, he was just kind of rattling on there. But, uh, he was, he was uh, uh, attacking you and your performance and virtually everything he could and said, you can no longer hide behind a legal fiction. Um, and I didn't see any connection with anything else he th had been saying. So I wondered if you had seen anything. And apparently, you didn't see anything either. Um, the next person to ask questions was the gentlelady from California who consistently referred to um, civilian federal agents as federal troops and intimating, if you will, that uh, Portland was peaceable until federal civilian agents arrived on the scene. Essentially, it's kind of analogous to blaming a fire department for showing up to put out a fire and then being blamed for starting the fire. Attorney General Barr, let's just have it on the record. Was there violence and attempts to burn down, vandalize the building and attack um, civilian employees of the federal government prior to any other federal agents or the reinforcements being sent in of federal agents? Yeah, my recollection is our, our main effort to reinforce was around the 4th of July period and it had been going on for quite a while before that. Let's talk about Lafayette Square for a second. Um, the, uh, leading up to June 1st, you had violent mobs disobeying the 11 p.m. curfew. They set fire to parked cars, demolished coffee shops and banks, burned American flags, and even intentionally set fire to St. John's Episcopal Church near Lafayette Square. Secret Service and, and uh, Park Police appropriate use of safe restorative force um, actually cleared that up. In total, however, 51 U.S. Park Police officers were injured during the weekend leading up to the perimeter expansion. Can you, do you want to expand on, right. on the actions regarding Lafayette Park? Right, so for the 29th, 30th, and 31st, there was unprecedented uh, rioting right around uh, the White House, uh, very violent. During that time, as you say, about 50 Park Police and a comparable number is my recollection of Secret Service. Uh, so we had about, nine, I think, around 90 uh, officers injured. I'm talking about things like concussions. Uh, one was operated on and so forth. Uh, we had the president. It was so bad that, as it's been reported, uh, the Secret Service recommended the president go down to the shelter. We had a breach of the Treasury Department. Uh, the, the historical building on, on Lafayette Park was burned down, the lodge. Uh, St. Uh, John's was, uh, was set on fire. Bricks were thrown at the police repeatedly. They took crowbars and pried up the pavers at, on Lafayette Park and threw those at the police. Balloons of caustic liquid were thrown on the police. And uh, it was clear when I arrived at the White House on Monday, uh, there was total consensus that the, we couldn't allow that to happen uh, so close to the White House, uh, that kind of rioting. And therefore, we had to move the perimeter out uh, one block and push it up toward I Street. And there was already a plan in being at that point that the Park Police and the Secret Service had worked out the night before, uh, which was to put the perimeter further away and then give them time to put a non-scalable fence across the northern part of uh, the park. During the day, during Monday, the, uh, the, f the factors that led to the timing of it were uh, that that movement was going to be made as soon as there were enough uh, units in place to actually perform it, and units were very slow in getting into place throughout the day, much to my frustration because I wanted it moved uh, before there was a big buildup of demonstrators. Uh, and also the fencing had to be delivered. And when those things were accomplished, the tactical uh, commander in charge of the park police uh, proceeded with the with the movement of pushing the uh, 
the perimeter. So this was, this was something conceived of long before and didn't turn on the, the nature of the crowd, although I would say the crowd was very unruly. And, and while the tactical considerations were made by the park police, uh, you know, they, they tried to respond to the situation. To say that this had to do uh, with a photo on a business, you know, and I don't mean to analogize this to a military operation, but it's akin to saying that we invaded the Philippines in World War II so Douglas MacArthur could walk through the surf on the beach. One follows the other, but we did not invade the Philippines so that Douglas MacArthur could walk to the beach. Thank you. You'll Gentleman yields back, uh, Mr. Swalwell. Mr. Barr, have you ever intervened other than to help the President's friend get a reduced prison sentence for any other case where a prosecutor had filed a sentencing recommendation with the court? A sentencing recommendation? Yeah. Have you ever intervened other than that case with the President's friend? Not that I recall. If you're talking Does that seem like something you'd recall where you would? Well, I'm, I'm saying I can't really remember my first, if you let me finish the question. I, I, I can't remember. 30 deal. years ago, I was Attorney General. As Attorney General now. Uh, but, uh, no, I didn't. But that's because issues come up to the Attorney General in a dispute. And I have never heard so of a dispute. I've never heard of a dispute in the department Mr. where Barr. line prosecutors threatened to quit because of a Barr, discussion over sentencing. Americans from both this. parties are concerned that in Donald Trump's America, there's two systems of justice, one for Mr. Trump and his cronies and another for the rest of us. But that can only happen if you enable it. At your confirmation hearing, you were asked, do you believe a president could lawfully issue a pardon in exchange for the recipient's promise to not incriminate him? You said, no. Not, not to what? That would be a crime. You were asked, could a president issue a pardon in exchange for the recipient's promise to not incriminate him? And you responded, no, that would be a crime. Is that right? Yes, I said that. You said a crime. You didn't say it'd be wrong. You didn't say it'd be unlawful. You said it'd be a crime. And when you said that, that a president swapping a pardon to silence a witness would be a crime, you were promising the American people that if you saw that, you would do something about it. Is that right? That's right. Now, Mr. Barr, are you investigating Donald Trump for commuting the prison sentence of his longtime friend and political advisor, Roger Stone? No. Why not? Why should I? Well, let's talk <laughs> about that. Mr. Stone was convicted by a jury on seven counts of lying in the Russia investigation. He bragged that he lied to save Trump's butt. But why would he lie? Your prosecutors, Mr. Barr, told a jury that Stone lied because the truth looked bad for Donald Trump. And what truth is that? Well, Donald Trump denied in written answers to the Russia investigators that he talked to Roger Stone during the time Roger Stone was in contact with agents of a Russian influence operation. There's evidence that Trump and Stone indeed did, did talk during that time. You would agree that it's a federal crime to lie under oath. Is that right? Yes. It's a crime for you, it's a crime for me, and it's certainly a crime for the President of the United States. Is that right? Yes. So if Donald Trump lied to the Mueller investigators, which you agree would be a crime, then Roger Stone was in a position to expose Donald Trump's lies. Are you familiar with the December 3rd, 2018 tweet where Donald Trump said Roger Stone had shown guts by not testifying against him? No, I'm not familiar with that. You don't read the President's tweets? No. Well, there's a lot of evidence in the president's treats, Mr. Attorney General. I think you should start reading them because he said Mr. Stone showed guts. But on July 10 of this year, Roger Stone declared to a reporter, I had 29 or 30 conversations with Trump during the campaign period. Trump knows I was under enormous pressure to turn on him. It would have eased my situation considerably, but I didn't. The prosecutors wanted me to play Judas. I refused. Are you familiar with that Stone statement? Actually, I'm not. So how can you sit here and tell us why should I investigate the President of the United States if you're not even aware of the facts concerning the President <laughs> using the pardon or commutation power to swap the silence of a witness? Because we, we require, uh, you know, a reliable predicate before we open a criminal investigation. And I just gave you some... Well, I, I don't consider it. I consider it a very Rube uh, Goldberg theory that you had. Well, it, it sounds like... You're hearing this and, and by the way, if I applied, if I applied this standard, there'd be, a lot, there'd be a lot more people under investigation. Mr. Attorney General, the very same day that Roger Stone said that, Donald Trump, That's one of the, no the, surprise. The, the true two standards sentence. of justice were really so, during the tail end of the Obama Mr. administration. Mr. Attorney General, let's turn to the Michael Cohen case. Are you aware, sir, that Michael Cohen, after being released from prison, was asked to not engage with the media, including to write a book? 
Were you aware that that was going to be asked of him? Was I aware? Yes. No. Do you know if anyone else in your department was aware? Uh, maybe I should tell you what happened. Why don't you tell us what happened? Okay. He was furloughed from the Bureau of Prisons. No, no. Why don't you tell us why he was asked? I will tell you. Agreement not because to something that people don't seem to understand is that his home confinement was not being supervised by the Bureau of Prisons. It, the was, being, of it was being supervised by the probation office, which is part of the U.S. court system. And Are it was the U.S. court system that had the requirements about and not yes, writing. That U.S. court system called your actions retaliatory. Do you I'm, agree with that? No. So all I know is what, I, what has been said in court before the judge and in the record, Mr. which Parker. is that the individual uh, was then called by the U.S. court system saying that this guy, Cohen, is uncooperative. He's not agreeing to the conditions. And at that point, a Bureau of Prisons person made the decision that he was no longer eligible for home confinement. Conditions that a federal judge said no other inmate had ever been asked of in his experience. Mr. Barr, you told ABC News that the president's tweets sometimes make your job impossible. But, sir, your job is only impossible if you enable the president's corrupt schemes. And I yield back. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, the, Mr. Attorney General, the Constitution says the President shall have the power uh, to grant uh, uh, reprieves and pardons for offenses against the United States, except in cases of impeachment. Do you note any other limitations in the Constitution on the President's power to pardon? No. Has the President exceeded that power? No. Uh, my uh, colleague from Georgia, Mr. Johnson, implied that uh, in challenging the sentencing recommendation of Roger Stone, you were doing the bidding of the President. He, he didn't want to hear your response. I, I would. Well, no, I was uh, uh, Roger Stone. I never discussed our sentencing recommendation with anyone outside the Department of Justice. And it was a very condensed period of time. I first heard, I, I made the decision that we shouldn't take a position as to the, the precise uh, uh, sentence, but should leave it up to the judge. And we should not affirmatively advocate for seven to nine years. And I made that uh, on Monday the 10th. And that that night we filed, the department filed, and it didn't reflect what I had decided. So that night I told people we had to fix it first thing in the morning. Uh, so uh, we did. As soon as I got in, we, 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 went for, we went forward with a plan to file. At that point I learned about the president's tweet because I don't monitor the president's tweets. Uh, and I hesitated because I knew that I would be attacked for doing it. Uh, and people would make the, you know, argue that I did it because of the tweet. But I felt at the end of the day I really had to go forward uh, with our filing because it was the right thing to do, and I'm glad the judge agreed with it. Uh, we're learning more and more about the targeting and prosecution and, and extortion of Michael Flynn by partisan officials at the FBI. No one has been held accountable for this grotesque abuse of power. Um, Knowing that agents with a political agenda can take anything that someone says, edit it, misrepresent it, prosecute it, and then extort confessions by threatening family members, and to do so with impunity, why would anyone in his right mind ever want to talk to an FBI agent again? Well, I, I don't, you know, I haven't reached judgments, and I'm not suggesting that all those facts he set forth are, are true, and, I, and we have not uh, at this point uh, uh, challenge the actions of the, I've defended the actions of the prosecutors in this case in court. Uh, my, my, the order of business right now uh, is knowing what we know now, uh, we don't think any uh, of the U.S. attorneys in the department would have prosecuted this case, uh, partly because of the behavior of the FBI, but also because the evidence is not there to prove it beyond a reasonable doubt. And part of what I'm trying to uh, establish is that we will use the same standards for everybody before we indict anybody. And this goes for every, both sides. Uh, we won't prosecute anyone, anybody unless there's proof beyond a reasonable doubt that they committed a crime. And not some kind of esoteric made-up crime, but a meat and potatoes crime. Um. For more than three years, the most powerful agencies in our government took information that was fabricated by agents of a political campaign that they knew was fraudulent, used it as justification to launch an investigation alleging treason against a presidential candidate, then leaked the existence of that investigation in a manner that was clearly calculated to affect the outcome of the election, 
and then failing that, used it in a largely successful attempt to obstruct the duly elected president. Are you going to be able to, to right this wrong before it becomes a precedent for future election interference by corrupt officials in our justice and intelligence agencies? You know, I, I really can't predict that. I think, uh, as you know, uh, John Durham is looking at all these matters. Uh, COVID did delay that action for a while, but he's working very diligently. And, you know, justice is not something you order up on a, a schedule like you're ordering a pizza. Well, there are many of us who are concerned that if you were succeeded by someone like Keith Ellison uh, as Attorney General, uh, uh, that this will become an institutionalized practice and the investigation of Mr. Durham will simply go away. I understand your concern. Uh, one more thing. A term we keep hearing from the left is, oh, these are mostly peaceful protests, mostly peaceful. It seems to me that you either are or you're not. Uh, calling what's happening in our cities mostly peaceful pro uh, protests is a, is a lot like calling Scott Peterson a mostly faithful husband or uh, Al Capone a mostly law-abiding businessman. Um, there is a constitutional right to peaceably assemble. Where does that right stop? when it becomes violence, criminal activity. You know, and that's the challenge here. I mean, uh, you have a lot of people who are out protesting and demonstrating, and that's uh, important First Amendment activity that we believe strongly in and try to protect. Um, and uh, the particular violent opportunists that are involved here get into those crowds and then start engaging in very violent activity and, and hijack it. And a lot of protesters have been telling law enforcement and providing information to us about these people who are not with them, they're not demonstrators, but they're coming in. And a lot of demonstrators leave when that happens because they can see what's happening themselves. Would you call that violence a myth? Gentlemen's time? No. The gentleman's time has expired, Mr. Liu. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, thank you, Mr. Barr, for being here today. I'd like to ask you some questions about the legal standard for seizing and arresting protesters. Uh, under the Fourth Amendment, it requires probable cause before you can seize and arrest a protester, correct? Yes. Yes. Okay. And the probable cause has to be particularized to a particular person. So if a protester was merely standing around in a crowd in the vicinity of someone else suspected of criminal activity, you cannot arrest that peaceful protester. In other words, there's no such thing as probable cause by mere association, correct? Well, not strictly, but I, I'll, I'll say that, you know, you do need particularized probable cause. Okay, and if there's no probable cause, if someone jumps into a getaway car correct? and there are three or four people in there, that might be enough to give you probable cause, just those circumstances. You, you don't need it on each individual. Re reclaiming my time, Mr. Attorney General. If there is no probable cause, you can't arrest a protester, correct? I said at the beginning, arrest has to be predicated on probable cause. All right. Now, an arrest can also occur whether or not the federal official says it's an arrest. So, for example, if a federal officer takes a protester into custody, transport that protester, let's say, to a federal building, detains a person for questioning, that will constitute an arrest whether or not the federal official says the person is under arrest, correct? Well, that would require a very intensive in, uh, review of all the specifics involved. Uh, actually, it wouldn't. Uh, in the case of Dunaway versus New York, which is black letter law for over 40 years, the question was whether the police violated the Fourth and Fifteenth Amendments when, without probable cause to arrest, they took petitioners into custody, transported him to a police station, and detained him for questioning. So the answer is yes, that would constitute an no, arrest. No, the answer is that, you know, Fourth Amendment is ultimately governed by reasonableness, and there can be circumstances. The question sometimes is when does something actually become custody? Reclaiming my time, I'm cite this is not a trick question. Mr. Barr, I'm just citing you what the Supreme Court said. So here's a problem. Under this standard black letter law, which has been in effect for over 40 years, what the federal forces in Portland did was unconstitutional. Federal forces in full combat gear, in the dark of night, grabbed a protester who was peacefully standing there, forced him into an unmarked van, drove him to a separate location, searched him, 
detained him and questioned him. That is what police states do. That's what authoritarian yeah, regimes do. But I don't do. think those were the facts. That's not, I haven't asked you a question yet, Mr. Barr. Okay. What the federal, federal officials did was illegal because they didn't have probable cause. And how do we know that? Because Deputy Director of the Federal Protective Service, Chris Klein, admitted it on national TV. Deputy Director Klein said that the individual that they were questioning was in a crowd and in an area where another individual was aiming a laser at the eyes of officers. That's guilt by association. That's what the Fourth Amendment prohibits. Deputy Director Klein further stated that the protester was released after federal officials concluded, quote, they did not have what they needed, unquote, which again shows there's no probable cause. And it appears that federal uh, Deputy Director Klein appears to understand that there was no probable cause because he essentially justifies that action as saying it wasn't an arrest. He calls it, quote, a simple engagement, unquote. I'm a former prosecutor. I've never heard that term, a simple engagement, because it's a made-up excuse. What these federal officials did was an arrest. They grabbed a peaceful protester, they forced him into a van, drove him to another location, questioned him. That is exactly what the Supreme Court prohibited over 40 years ago. So I obviously, incident. I obviously don't know that. Washington Post, I'm, I haven't asked you a question yet. In a Washington Post article on July 24th entitled Operation Diligent Valor, federal agents told reporters that there's no basis for these arrests. They said, quote, at times they have grabbed an individual and taken them inside the courthouse for questioning before determining that they had no probable cause to charge them with any crime, unquote. W. Director Klein said that they um, coordinate with the U.S. Attorney's Office on all of these arrests. I urge you to instruct your federal officials to comply with the Constitution, and I ask you to investigate these arrests because many of them are in violation of the Fourth Amendment. We do not live in a police state. We are better than that. I yield back. Gentleman yields back, Ms. Lesko. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, since Representative Liu didn't allow you any time to answer his allegations, would you care to answer any of his allegations? Yes. I mean, obviously, I, I don't know all the particulars of any individual case out there, but uh, based on my general understanding, uh, what had happened uh, was that when they tried to effectuate arrests of the ringleaders or the people who were engaged in violence or that they saw with lasers and so forth, and they went out. They were immediately swarmed by people in black, and there was a lot of violence, so they couldn't effectuate the rest. So the modus operandi was changed, and based on uh, specific information as to individuals who were seen doing things and identified, they later tried to pick them up uh, when there was less of a risk of this kind of mob response. The fact that you, if you have information uh, that someone has a laser and is using it and later pick him up and he doesn't have it, it doesn't mean that there wasn't probable cause. It means he doesn't have the laser. The question is, you know, was it reasonable for you to rely on the information that you had and the identification of that individual? In some cases, it could be a misidentification. In other cases, it could be the person, you know, ditched the laser. So there is a distinction between whether the person ultimately can be shown to have violated the law and whether there was probable cause for the police to make the inquiry and, and, and take them and, and interrogate them or ask them questions at least. Thank you, Mr. Attorney General. You know, I think um, I have to tell you, you probably know this. My constituents are scared. Americans are scared. I mean, they watch the TV. They see all this rioting, looting going on, statues being torn down. Uh, in Arizona, uh, where I'm from, more guns are being sold than ever. I think there's more new gun owners uh, than ever. And uh, this has to stop. And I think that it's really important, as the saying goes, that in order to solve a problem, the first step is to realize there's a problem. And so it always, I find it very disturbing, should I say, that Chairman Nadler de denies that Antifa even exists. He said it to a reporter. Um, he said on the floor of the Uni United States House of Representatives that it was a fantasy, a made-up fantasy. Uh, and then in this very room just recently, Congresswoman Jayapal, who represents the Seattle area, said 
when I was talking about the autonomous zone and the takeover, um, she said, the area is just a few miles from where I sit right now, and there is no takeover. There is no takeover. Uh, she also said, lies are being spread by my colleagues in this committee. This area is perfectly peaceful. Um, she also said, my Republican colleagues keep saying the Seattle police precinct was taken over by protesters. This is incorrect. Incorrect. No one has taken over that building. Um, Mr. Attorney General, is that your understanding of what happened there? Do, do you agree with Ms. Jayapal that there was no takeover? It was just Jayapal. Peaceful? If you're going to say my Jayapal? name, please say it right. It's Jayapal. Jayapal, do you, would you agree with that? And also, in answer, why do you think these autonomous zones in Democrat-led cities are dangerous to America? Well, starting with the, uh, they're dangerous because uh, they are purporting to keep on the outside uh, duly constituted authority of the government. They're also, to me, uh, outrageous because these pe the people who are living now under this autonomous zone haven't selected the government. They've selected the duly authorized government of the city and the state. So it's quite an outrage that, that people would, would take, use force to take over an area. What, what makes me concerned for the country is this is the first time in my memory that the leaders of one of our great two political parties – uh, the Democratic Party are not coming out and condemning mob violence and the attack on federal courts. Uh, why can't we just say, you know, the, the violence against federal courts has to stop? Could we hear something like that? Mr. Attorney General, I totally agree. I support what you're doing, and I support what President Trump is doing for law and order in our country, and I yield back. The gentlelady yields back. The committee will stand in recess for five minutes.